Star of the Unborn. Part 1. The First Day. Iron Gray Turf. Motto. If it is the concern of politicians and rhetoricians to interpret the intrigues of everyday life, it is the business of poets and storytellers to visit the creatures of myth and fable on their islands, the dead in Hades, and the unborn on their star. Diodorus, the travel writer, in his book Famous Burial Places, circa 350 BC. The first chapter, wherein the author appears to be prologizing, but the reader soon discovers that he is apologizing. This is a first chapter simply because it seemed inappropriate to begin this opuscule with a second chapter. The only factors that stood in the way of placing the words chapter 2 on the first page of this novel were the publisher's sense of propriety, the reading public's well-known propensity for the discovery of monstrous typographical errors, and, finally, the author's mania for originality since he feared that some colleague in the gaily flippant era of Romanticism must certainly have begun one of his rank works with a second chapter. For these reasons we begin with chapter 1. No matter how superfluous this chapter may be for the progress of the action, or, more accurately, of the exploration. Since we are dealing with a kind of travelogue, I feel the obligation to introduce the hero, or, more modestly, the central figure of the occurrences here set forth. This particular literary form has the unfortunate weakness that the eye that sees, the ear that hears, the spirit that comprehends, the voice that narrates, the eye that is involved in many adventures, constitutes the central point about which, in the most literal sense, everything revolves. This central point, candidly designated as FW, is, unfortunately, I myself. Purely from an innate aversion to getting into difficulties, I should have preferred not to be I myself in these pages. Still, it was not only the most natural, but the only way, and I was regrettably unable to invent any he that could adequately have borne the burden of the I for me. And so the I of this story is not a deceptive, novelistic, assumed, fictitious I any more than the story itself is the mere offspring of speculative imagination. It happened to me, as I must confess, quite against my will. Without the slightest preparation or premonition, contrary to all my habits and instincts, I was sent out one night as an explorer. What I experienced, I really experienced. I am quite prepared to embark upon a frank discussion of this little word, really, with any philosophically-minded reader, and I am confident that I will win the argument in every instance. As I inscribe this record, I am still living, and living again. In the precise space between the words still and again lies the world of my voyage of discovery and exploration which I began as an ignorant, even recalcitrant. Tourist in order to complete it as a keen observer with a few new and definite ideas in my pocket. It would indubitably be a great mistake on the part of the reader to close the book in disgust at this point. Little mysteries such as still and again are the obscurities and riddles of a first chapter which chapter 2 will soon resolve. In order to obviate any grave misunderstandings, let me say at the outset that I am by no means a master dreamer. I do not dream more vividly than other people. When morning breaks I have usually forgotten my dreams. Now and then, to be sure, the gray dawn deposits a few strange tableaus and scenes on my counterpane as flotsam of the night. There is, for example, a dog that discourses in rational words. A radiant bride, whom I have never seen clad in a trailing bridal veil, stands with open arms at my bedside. A bearded man in overalls who is called the worker operates fountains that do not run water, but strange beams of light. Again, I see with indescribable clarity aged men who, instead of dying, become smaller and smaller until they are finally embedded in the earth as tiny anthropomorphic turnips. Such pictures and scenes, as far as the memory does not eject them, are stubborn. Self-willed germs that sprout and grow in the soil of fancy during the day whether you like it or not. Rarely, and yet once of twice in a lifetime, it happens that these autonomous visions, independent as they are of the inventive will, join into logical chains and epic sequences in a single night or even in several successive nights. Whenever that happens, 
A person would be a dull oaf indeed if he were not thrilled by the meaningful games that his soul plays behind his back, as if it were not a narrow, restricted ego but a boundless, infinite universe. There are only two ways of becoming a historian of the future, scientific deduction and divination or fortune-telling. But scientific deduction would disqualify itself for cognition of the future by the process of scientific deduction. For science must always be careful not to make a fool of itself. Science would scarcely go further than a computation of probabilities. Divination and fortune-telling, on the other hand, have the inestimable advantage of looking back upon a long and venerable practice which, according to incontrovertible tradition, has produced remarkably successful results. In order to be genuine, the prophetic forms of cognition must know only how to wear the veil of parable and to cast the shadow of mystery. Stem eyes have been looking at me for some time. They are becoming ever sterner, and now they even address me. Asterisk, you are a man of fairly mature years. You certainly don't have enough time left to take superfluous trips. How much longer will you waste your diminishing working day? Don't you know what's going on in the world today? Weren't you yourself a persecuted victim? Aren't you still? Don't you hear the roar of the bombers, the clatter of heavy machine guns that envelop the globe, a Nessus garment woven of explosions? Worse than this noise, don't you hear the death rattle of the mortally wounded in a thousand places and at every hour? And worse than this death rattle, don't you hear the cry of torment and the dying gasp of the millions who are first ravished, then tortured, and finally massacred? Isn't it your responsibility to keep your eyes and ears focused on this monstrous reality that outfancies the maddest visions of a pain demon and is, at the same time, as final as a mathematical process? What higher duty have you than to catch the cry of torment and the grasp of the tortured and to preserve them in the graven word, at least for the brief span in which the experience and expression of one generation remain intelligible to the next? I can do nothing. Oh, stern eyes, but lower my own before you. I confess and acknowledge, my time is short and I am wasting it unscrupulously. I have not forgotten that I too am persecuted, nor have I become too deaf to hear the roar of the bombers, the clatter of heavy machine guns, the death rattle of the mortally wounded, the cry of torment and the dying gasp of the ravished, the tortured, the massacred, the monstrous reality, the mad visions of a pain demon, constrict my throat by day and night, where I walk and stand, on the street and in my room, at work and at play. Of course I am neglecting my duty, but this reality does not leave me even enough breath for an echoing groan to the cry of torment. In mitigation of my guilt, I can only reply with an unexpected banality. I had already purchased a huge stack of fine, smooth paper. I had already sat down and on the uppermost sheet of the stack, enough for at least two volumes. I had carefully inscribed in beautiful Spencerian characters the words, Chapter 1. It was to be the beginning of the story that, God willing, I shall one day dedicate to the ravished, the tortured, the moss sacred. But unfortunately the pen was no good. It is so hard nowadays to get the right kind of pen. Even the best fountain pens are stiff and hard and stubborn and two-pointed, and they simply won't respond. It is a good thing that the reading public knows very little about an author's workshop. A real author is a man who writes with the most responsive, most sensitive hand, not one who pounds inanimate keys. But just such a man requires certain inspiring desk equipment. Above all, he needs a good pen, soft and flexible, capable of the most delicate, the most timid, serif, and of the blackest, boldest downstroke. Such a pen delineates the structure of a sentence on the paper like a master drawing. A good pen, and I am not facetious, is half the thought. So I went out to find a good pen, but I found only a tolerable one. The hunt occupied several days. On the night of the last of these days, however, this event befell me which I shall call my calm mission on a voyage of exploration. The material I brought home in spirit from this voyage was extensive, more extensive even than is indicated by a tome as voluminous as this threatens to become. I had to make my choice. Before me lay the white sheet bare ing the words chapter one, in large, round letters, and nothing else. These imperious words seemed to make the just demand that the story of our monstrous present should follow them in serried ranks. But I shuddered at the task. 
Will not this monstrous reality become more real from day to day, and most real and true, perhaps, when it no longer exists? But the reality of my travel experience is spun of other stuff. It is likely to dissolve at the first crow of the cock or at the honk of a horn, and even the best memory offers no guarantee that it will not escape suddenly beyond recall. Therefore, I must hurry. And under the words chapter one, that are still waiting for the story of our monstrous reality, I decided to sketch the foregoing paragraphs. It is a superstitious trick. I have not forfeited anything. I have not given up my original task. The chapter one, that was to have borne an incomparable load, still stands empty. For this, I repeat in conclusion, with the full agreement of my readers, is not a first chapter. Instead, Chapter 2 assumes the function of Chapter 1. The Second Chapter Where I meet my friend B.H. who calls my attention to the fact that I am invisible. What? You're not dead, B.H. I asked my best and oldest friend and shook his hand, delighted to see him again. A weight fell from my heart at this meeting after so many years. In the course of the great flight from the Nazis, he had been driven from place to place, finally to land in India, in the far northern part, at the Tibetan border, somewhere in the vicinity of Darjeeling. And the war had broken all communication between us. Who knows, perhaps I should have tried after all to write him a letter, or to make inquiries through the Red Cross, to see whether I could help him. Although I had no evidence of it, I was convinced that he had perished. B.H. smiled and at the same time his large head with its black hair and fine, dark eyes trembled a little, in fact it almost shook. It had been a habit of his long ago when we were schoolmates whenever he succeeded in making a particularly devastating remark. I'm not dead, B.H. said with a twinkle. As you see, I'm quite alive and in full possession of my faculties. It's you who are dead, F.W., and you've been dead far, far longer than you can remember. How can I be dead? B.H. I asked, offended by his frankness which seemed to be in bad taste, although I had been guilty of the same indiscretion just a moment earlier. B.H. looked at me long and earnestly before he made up his mind to ask, Can you see me, F.W.? Of course I can see you. How do you manage at 50 to look like 25? No, even that's an exaggeration. You look exactly as you did the day we graduated. According to the present method of computing ages, I am a hundred and seven years old, he replied straight to the point. But how about you, F.W., he insisted. Can you see yourself? I looked down along my body. I could not see myself. A sudden shock galvanized me. I was invisible. To be invisible to others is depressing enough. But to be invisible to myself, I tried to collect my scattered thoughts and emotions. First of all, I noticed with surprise that I was feeling well. Uncommonly well, in fact, certainly much better than a while ago. When was that a while ago? When I presumably stepped out of a gate at a considerable distance from this spot and somehow lost my way on a strange road where I suddenly met my old friend B.H. Incidentally, I'm not at all certain that I am right in using the word road. It was obviously leveled ground that extended evenly in all directions to the horizon without any sign of interruption on the right or left by embankments or roadside ditches. Under my feet was short, dry turf that expedited progress remarkably well and made walking a novel pleasure. The turf consists of well-tended grass, but this grass had lost even the slightest tinge of green, the last trace of chlorophyll. It grew out of the ground in shades varying from white to iron gray, like the hair on the skull of an aging though still robust man. The phrase, under my feet, was not a stylistic error, as one or another of my readers at once suspected. Although I was invisible to others and even to myself, I really possessed hands and feet and, in fact, the entire body to which I had so long been accustomed. Why V to low I was invisible, I was certainly not incorporeal. To be sure, when I felt along my sides with my good old hands, I felt nothing but space. But within this void I could feel my heart beating more regularly and calmly than ever. My lungs expanded and contract. I could see, hear, smell, and taste. My youthful well-being seemed to arise from the fact that these sensory functions did not, as formerly, have to operate through a ponderous mate-real body that was already worn out in spots. 
To use a banal and only half suitable analogy, I felt as light and mobile as a fat man hopes to feel after a conscientiously rigorous reducing treatment. Was BH right? And was it really the rigorous, the imminently successful, reducing treatment of death that I had undergone with such splendid results? I did not doubt the PS ability for a moment. And yet, though I don't know why, I experienced a sense of shame at this instant. I was ashamed not only on my own account, but also on BH's. It was a shame similar to that of being naked, a nakedness, moreover, beyond all conception and imagination. In order to extricate myself, and, perhaps, BH too, from this embarrassment, I muttered, what a lot of nonsense we dream at times. BH shook his head with a touch of irony. They used to hand out very silly theories about such matters, he commented. You aren't speaking about Freud's interpretation of dreams, are you, BH? He looked at me with an effort at concentration, as though he failed to understand me. Who? Freud? Fraud? What's that? How do you expect me to remember names from the beginnings of mankind? He asked a little disdainfully. The beginnings of mankind? I echoed, and I clearly felt that a tinge of offended emotion colored the voice which rang from my invisible mouth and from my equally invisible inwards. The beginnings of mankind? Were those the beginnings of mankind? My dear B.H., when we read Shakespeare and Goethe together, when we argued about Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, about Pascal and Kierkegaard, and the parkways of the Belvedere? Don't you remember? It was just recently, it was yesterday, maybe it was only this morning, because you look like a college student right now. And then we entered the army in the First World War, you and I, and later on we used to write letters to each other, and we met again from time to time. For the spiritual friendship of early youth is a strong bond for men's hearts. And you were BH, and I was FW. And then the Nazis came, and I saw you once more on the shore of our beloved Mediterranean. You were on your way to India. What a sad parting it was for me. I felt that we would never see each other again, for the Second World War was already waiting just outside the park gate of the loveliest French summer. We both had dreadful experiences, you in a camp at the edge of Tibet, and I on my flight from Europe. I was afraid you had died in India, but maybe the Tibetan monks taught you how to go on living forever in spite of everything. I, on the other hand, am living in California at present. Still, it may be that I am buried in California, for you have convinced me of my fearful invisibility, and all of it is so terribly real and recent. I don't understand your irony about the beginnings of mankind. Our two situations, my dear F.W., he interrupted me gently, are radically different. You have preserved all these memories of the beginnings of mankind so vividly because you haven't had a turn in the meantime. Haven't had a turn? I snapped at him. What do you mean by this infantile expression? You seem to have preserved a pretty good memory of our high school jargon. Have a turn? DP, you mean being called on by the teacher? Quite right, FW, he nodded with a certain degree of pride. And it happens to be my turn just now, that is to say, I am living. I decided to keep quiet, although I had a hard time doing it. By virtue of my invisibility, or rather my transparent, intangible, and imponderable corporeality, my thoughts swirled in violent rapids, and I understood and recognized many things in a novel and penetrating manner. My spirit functioned in the nature of a highly polyphonic orchestral score. A number of cognitions, like a musical fugue, developed in harmonious confusion, and yet they formed a meaningful entity of which I became fully aware. So, I thought, B.H.'s sojourn in Tibet had a definite influence on him after all. Without a doubt he embraced the most orthodox form of the doctrine of reincarnation, in fact, reincarnation itself. That's what he meant by having a turn. Should I for that reason turn away from B.H. and drop him like a hot potato? Does the doctrine or the practice of reincarnation contradict my own belief in immortality? No, I decided without hesitation. In the first place, my belief in immortality was no longer a belief at all, but a well-authenticated phenomenon. I myself furnished the incontrovertible proof in my present invisible and yet animate state. According to the plane, unvarnished testimony of my best friend, I was long deceased and probably buried in forest lawn, 
If that fashionable resting place had not been abandoned generations ago and turned over to some oil syndicate for exploitation. Yet here I was, in passably good shape, and I felt and reasoned with increased acuteness. Thank God, Descartes, Cogito, ergo sum, applied to me after death. What a moral victory over the sum, ergo cogito, of my materialistic opponents, those stupid literary hacks. But about this matter of reincarnation, wasn't it only yesterday afternoon that I had experienced a sudden enlightenment? The place, to be sure, where this spiritual flash of inspiration struck me wasn't particularly conducive to philosophy, a drugstore on Wilshire Boulevard. I forgot to finish my coffee. Just how was that? Just how did that go? Every ego, I had reasoned, is immortal, but not every ego is a complete ego. Just as in the material world, for example, in the world of roses, an individual blossom must be repeated down to the last detail from time to time, just so it must be in the world of men, in physical, intellectual, and spiritual aspects. The variety of forms in nature is limited, and the same is true of the variety of forms in humanity. There is only a limited number of souls, of definite egos, much smaller than the number of names which these egos bear in the course of their permutations. Every ego, like a more or less successful book, appears successively in various editions, and each time under a new title. When God counts the souls on the day of judgment, as the good book says, he will not count 370 quintillion souls, more or less, but only somewhere between 700,000 and 70 billion the fewer the better. At the end of time, every ego will be a big bouquet of incarnations, a sort of dust-covered nomadic tribe that roved through the desert of eons. Still, it was most surprising that the BH of the present should be the spitting image of the BH of the beginnings of mankind. I felt a touch of vertigo and quickly interrupted this stream of thought. For a long time, I stared intently at BH without realizing that my concentration could mean nothing to him. All right, old man. I thought, go right ahead with your drivel. I won't say another word. The whole business makes me tired. B.H. stepped closer to me. Not the slightest reproach lay in his smile. We've been invited, F.W., he said and made a futile attempt to slap me on a shoulder which, of course, was non-existent for him. Invited? I asked in a worried tone. But then I heard my own resigned sigh. Do whatever you please. I suppose I'll have to agree to everything. These words of mine sounded rather pitiful, but they produced the same sort of relief that a bewildered tourist feels when he puts the details of his day's activities into the hands of an experienced and trusted guide. The Third Chapter Wherein I Become Acquainted with a Novel Method of Locomotion After this conversation, which seemed very short to me, I began to scan the surrounding terrain with my invisible but seeing eye. Strangely, but without a doubt, B.H. and I, two confirmed city dwellers, had met out in the open country. It was the openest, flattest country that I had ever seen, and besides it seemed to be entirely uninhabited. As far as the eye reached, there was not the slightest indication of a settlement, whether city or village. No structure of any sort rose from the smooth plain no filling station near or far, no water tank, not even a single one of the big billboards that ordinarily grace or disgrace the loneliest desert roads. Yet, in spite of the limitless and unsubdivided solitude, I could not rid myself of the feeling of standing in a road. The dense, miraculously close-cropped iron-gray turf that completely covered the ground could be only the result of human planting and care. The entire region, from horizon to horizon, seemed to be a highway, a highway covered, not with asphalt, but with this morning-colored carpet for promenaders. A highway without the slightest hint of traffic, and yet somehow reminiscent of incalculable traffic, of a time when thousands of lines of flashing vehicles raced in straight, unbroken procession in both directions. Only gradually, I became aware that the flatness and solitude were not as uninterrupted as I had first suspected. At great intervals my eye, as it slowly became accustomed to the utter strangeness of this world, began to discern occasional groups of trees, or rather clumps of trees, for they were planted so close that no breaks or gaps were visible, and they gave an unnatural effect of compactness. These trees, and it took some time before I recognized them as trees, 
were all alike and quite low. Their rigid crowns were composed of leathery, almost black foliage, from which gleamed great waxy blossoms whose yellowish-white hue was tinged with hints of various colors. I had never seen similar plants. It occurred to me at once that if these clumps of trees concealed some form of life under their canopy, it must be a very delicate and woebegone life. The sky was cloudless, and in its deep blue solitude resembled the gray earth over which it arched. The time of day was presumably not far advanced, for the orb of the sun, somewhat larger and redder than in my memory, was just past its zenith and cast dazzling rays which produced a temperature that I can only call cold heat or hot cold. Although I definitely felt the need of dark glasses, I was becoming increasingly chilly in spite of my invisible state. I looked questioningly, perhaps even impatiently, at B.H. He at once divined my thoughts. His manner of guessing my train of thought made me very uncomfortable. Was that the result of his Tibetan training? I asked myself. Or was it the achievement of a human race that was far beyond its early stages? To the embarrassing feeling of nakedness caused by my invisibility was now added the timid shame that I was not quite able to conceal my thoughts, wishes, plans, my consent, dissent, my doubts, and my criticisms. Our appointment, he said without awaiting my question, is taking place in California. What are you talking about, B.H.? I rejoined, unable to repress a trace of rising annoyance. I know California. That's where I used to live. Perhaps I'm still living there, in spite of your curious theory concerning me and my death. Besides, I don't remember having made an appointment with you. If you had told me that we were standing in the Middle West, back there where the endless prairies used to be, I might have believed you at once. But I know California pretty well. It is appropriately called a paradise, although certain snobs have been known to make disparaging remarks about this lovely spot, and there are even some who claim to prefer the flat Florida landscape to the diversified West Coast. These snobs slanderously call California a desert covered with artificial luxuriance, whose rouged roses, bougainvilleas, poinsettias, and other flowers have no fragrance, whose fruits and vegetables have no savor, whose inhabitants are good-looking but somehow Lemurian. That may be connected with the fact that long before the beginnings of mankind as we knew them, California was a part of the submerged continent of Lemuria. That may have influenced the character of the Californians. The Lemurians seem to have been a shadowy, trifling race, whited sepulchers, in a word, actors, who deceived the world with gay and false pretenses with nothing true and tested behind them. There is a contemporary expression for this Lemurian characteristic, the word phony. And so the snobs of today, I mean our own today or yesterday, turn up their noses at California, chiefly because a certain famous city in that state produces films, those fantastic, photographic tales that have become the vogue of their time although. Or perhaps just because, they are Lemurian. But maybe you and your contemporary humanity have completely forgotten what a film is. B.H. shook his head slowly and gave me a frank look. No, we really don't know anything about that. Never mind, B.H., I resumed, slightly astonished at my own excited eloquence. This California is largely a mountainous country. Toward the east rise the snow-covered Sierras on whose peaks perhaps no human foot is ever trod. But in the west, too, where the Pacific Ocean gnaws at the shore, there are mountains and hills everywhere, even though they may be only sand dunes of weathered, decomposed granite. Between them are broad valleys planted with fabulous orchards, oranges, lemons, grapefruit. They blossom the year around with a fragrance that beggars description. And in April, even the deserts bloom, pink and violet with their countless cacti. Wherever you turn, the mountains tower in the blue distance. But here, you forget. B.H. interrupted me that you have skipped several lengthy geologic periods slash it sounded like skipping a recitation at school. Meanwhile, most of the elevations of the Earth's surface have been leveled off, partly by the regular geological development of the planet, partly by the purposeful will of its inhabitants, and partly by that grandiose, decisive event about which I will say nothing at present, lest I frighten you too much. At any rate, there are no more mountains except outside the cultural zone. Of course, there was nothing to be said to that. Only to be grumbling, I muttered. It's all so monotonous. I wish there were a city here. We are in a city, 
said my friend good-naturedly and chuckled over Twy point he had made, before adding after a while, we are in a city, if you mean by that a connected settlement. Everything you see is city. California is the name of a city. After a few hundred miles it merges with cities that have other names, although the boundaries between these cities are of abstract, purely spiritual character, for the entire inhabited globe is a single city. All right, all right, call it a city, I said, tired rather than acquiescent, although I get homesick when I think of the towers and gates of our medieval city back home, its stronghold, the Hradshin, its Gothic and Baroque palaces. What? And you say I've been invited here? Didn't you tell me a while ago that I had been invited here? Or did I only dream it? His voice became quite solemn. You have been more than invited. You have been summoned. Without a doubt, my invisibility came to the aid of my intelligence and my quick comprehension. I understood him at once. I had been summoned. Whom does one summon? The spirits of the dead. Without any particular feeling of uncanniness, I was such a spirit. And who summons us? Spiritualists, such as, for the most part, sweater-knitting old ladies, pension peacetime generals, retired officials, and their ilk. Everyone knows these simpletons that sit around a bouncing table. So it's come to that, I exclaimed angrily. The same old nonsense that we used to laugh at away back in the beginnings of mankind. You summon the spirits of the dead. Plato, Napoleon, Jack the Ripper, and Madame Pompadour? It's beyond belief. And I, I can't help myself, and I have to be a materialization, although even that is an exaggeration, for I'm not even an ectoplasmic phenomenon, but just plain invisible. I exist only as a state of consciousness. B.H. remained calm and serious. We have long ago rejected many things that would seem to you even more beyond belief if you knew about them, but we have preserved and developed a few things that you despised in your day. In my day? Wasn't it your day too, B.H.? Certainly, F.W. Among other days, it was my day too. And why did you have me summoned, me of all people? After a protracted silence, he asked me in return, didn't you have to think of me a great deal in the last few days, F.W.? In any case, you seem to be solely responsible for getting me into the embarrassing situation of being here. No, there was general approval of your name, he quickly dissented. At his words, a thrill of conceit ran through me, from my invisible pate to my invisible toes. Think of it. After fifty, sixty, perhaps a hundred thousand years, they still knew my name. Mountains had been leveled. Oceans had dried up. The gravitation of the sun seemed to be failing. Presumably the earth had moved farther from the sun, and that was the reason for these glaring but feeble rays under which even a ghost like me felt chilly. Perhaps the days, too, had become longer and human life with them. Didn't B.H. say he was a hundred and seven years old? And in spite of all these changes beyond measure and beyond concept, they still knew my name. The name of a man whose sole unmerited merit was the fact that between endless periods of dullness and laziness he had used a few frenetic hours to fill a number of blank pages with words, rhymed and unrhymed. B.H., of course, guessed my presumptuous thoughts without delay. No, no, old man. That isn't it. He laughed almost maliciously. People have hardly any appreciation for things like that now. I simply drew your name out of the alphabet. Back in the dark days of the beginnings of mankind, we would have said T greater than Y chance. All the members of the household liked your name, and we agreed unanimously that F.W. should be our wedding guest and should cast a glance from his primitive time into our own advanced time. And through him, we want to feel a breath of the invigorating air of that primitive era of which we know so little. That's all there is to it. That's why we summoned you. So now I'm not only a wedding guest, but also a Darwinian ape, I murmured to myself. Quick as a flash, I surveyed my unusual situation. I had died at least sixty to a hundred thousand years ago, at any rate in astronomical Ian. I had not spent the interim between my death and the present moment in a state of complete unconsciousness. The life I had lived had produced such strong after-effects in me that the well-nigh interminable interval had seemed no longer and no more significant than a short night. In this short night, to be sure, a number of things had evidently befallen me that had not yet made themselves entirely clear. My friend B.H., meanwhile, trained by Tibetan monks, 
had experienced one or more reincarnations, smart fellow that he was. And at this very time he was participating in an advanced era of humanity, in which a person of 107 years looked like an undergraduate of 1910. He it was who, thanks to the technically highly developed spiritualism of these times, had had me summoned into life, even though not genuine life. Up to now I was not sufficiently swept away by my travel experiences to have any doubts about its genuineness. What was the difference? I should be less sensitive and less choleric. Moreover, my invisible state, though not comparable with true life, spared me the perils, risks, and intellectual demounts of an existence identical with itself. I could let my curiosity row freely. Such an opportunity would knock only once. These were my thoughts. Aloud I exclaimed, What are we waiting for, B.H.? We're not going to this wedding on foot, are we? Certainly, he nodded. We're going on foot. It's only four hundred miles from here. My ears must have deceived me. I rotated on my own invisible axis and peered in all directions. Where's your car? Where's the nearest parking lot? I assume that nowadays every infant owns a power perambulator, and while mother performs her household duties, she guides it through the heaviest traffic with complete safety by short wave. We had almost reached that point even back in my time. By car, do you mean something that rolls on wheels? Asked the reincarnated B.H., strain of thinking and slight disgust about his youthful mouth. I strove to keep my composure. Listen to me, B.H. You claim we are in the middle of a city, that is, a connected settlement. But what kind of city is this that rivals the pontine desolation of a primitive landscape that has either not yet been discovered or has already been abandoned? Don't you remember from your various reincarnations what a modem metropolis is, or at least, what it was? Have you forgotten the tens of thousands of sleek, smoothly gliding vehicles that were dammed up like a mill stream by the red stoplights, to be released like a dazzling mill race by the green lights? And have you forgotten the slowly rolling lava of greedy crowds before the plate glass of huge show windows that continually goaded the jaded sensuality to fulfillably unfulfillable desire? And at night the circling, flashing figures and neon lights over our heads? What am I talking about? I feel as though I have been cast away in the most reactionary void. Why, upon my word, in an extinct world of the most incomprehensible retrogression, is it possible that technology at whose early cradle we stood and from which we expected an infinitely beneficent future, has been utterly wasted and lost in a span of sixty to a hundred thousand years. My old friend smiled tolerantly at my words. It took much less than that span, he said, to eliminate what you call technology, a concept that is completely lost today. Although it was during this very span that the overwhelming event occurred which alone would have sufficed to extinguish the historical memory of mankind. This memory, however, was not entirely extinguished, but only slightly blurred with regard to the times before the event. The fact that we still number our years from the birth of Christ just as in the beginnings of mankind may serve as evidence for my statement. But technology, if I remember correctly, was a primitive abomination composed of mass murder, gasoline stench, electric high tension, splitting of atoms, useless, slow haste, and a mania for innervating comfort. We couldn't stand it today without becoming seriously ill. Who, for example, could seat himself in one of those clumsy, wheeled vehicles, a few of them have been preserved as curios, without exposing himself to a nervous breakdown? He stopped and looked at me hesitantly. I noticed for the first time now that B.H. was wearing an old field uniform of the First World War and wrapped puttees. When I took a second, good look, however, I became aware that it was only an imitation made out of some infinitely fine, silver-gray, filmy material, the like of which I had never seen before. I don't want to offend you, F.W., he continued. Men have always strained and stretched their strength to the limits set by their age. Of course we too make use of technical aids, if you please. Only our technology is silent and modest, not physical and chemical, but mental. Take a look at this instrument, for instance, that every contemporary carries with him. It spares our interior organs all adventures on rolling wheels. FOI, you know our entrails were never intended to alter their normal position. It even spares us the adventure of primitive rocket voyages through the air, 
a form of travel that had such ill effects on the oxygen economy of human hearts and lungs that certain generations never managed to live beyond 50 years of age. All the geniations that hurried back and forth through the air in order to buy and sell had to accept as a natural law an early death by heart failure. Fortunately, mankind has conquered such physical failings. I don't know how many tens of thousands of years ago. The historians don't agree about the exact date when the mate real form of traveling was replaced by the mathematical mental manner. But there's not the slightest doubt that this date is lost in grayest antiquity. Mathematical mental manner of traveling? I repeated in confusion. This thing, he consoled me, is based upon a fundamentally simple insight into the relativity of all moving points in the cosmos with reference to each other. It's as simple as all great things, and you can almost picture the honest, anonymous craftsman with smooth white hair who, in mythical days of yore, figured out the theory of relativity. In short, when we travel we do not move toward our objective, but we move our objective toward us. As he made this explanation, he held a thing under my nose that was larger than a watch and smaller than a desk barometer, in other words, about the size of a pocket compass. Since I had been staring at B.H.'s chewed fingernails, I did not at once become aware of the fact that I had seen instruments like this one long ago. It seemed to be a puzzle toy, such as I had owned in my childhood, in which certain little colored balls had to be maneuvered with skill and patience into certain small holes provided for them. I don't know anything about mathematics, I said evasively as I regarded the little toy with astonishment and with unspeakably sad emotions. Mathematics is only an auxiliary means, B.H. comforted me. It is a tautological operation that equates one symbol against another in order to discover an unknown result by means of such equation. It's perfectly simple to climb around on the ladder of equations, as you'll see for yourself in a moment. With his blunt index finger, he pointed at the glass-covered dial of tire puzzle. Do you see the two concentric circles of little holes? The outer one belongs to the realm of mathematics. The pale blue globules go in there. Here. As long as you're invisible, you can probably read this fine print without glasses. And, sure enough, I read without glasses and without trouble. Galactic time, planetary time, continental time, local time, galactic space, planetary space, continental space, local space, exact declination of the light lay. Well, here we are, said B.H. with childlike pleasure in his superior accomplishment, as he balanced and shook the pale blue globules into the holes with the above designations. The skill with which he managed the puzzle was quite beyond my comprehension. I don't understand anything about it, I blurted out, and, what's more, I don't care to understand anything about it. Undisturbed by my resistance, he continued his instruction, following the inner circle of the instrument with his fingernail. Now, take a look at this. Much more important than the mathematical astronomical circle is the mental circle. Pardon me, you might perhaps misunderstand the concept, mental slash it does not mean a mere activity of the intellect. We designate as mental every impulse of the soul, every emotion that is washed clean and therefore spiritualized by the light of consciousness. Why don't you pay attention? Are you tired of listening to me? Here, read along with me the designations over the little holes into which I will now roll the light green globules. Direction of the will, urgency for change, certainty regarding objective, probable period of impatience, probable period of patience. Stop, B.H. I interrupted him, seriously confused now. I have been invited or summoned, which is much worse, by utter strangers. I don't know who or what sort of people they are, what their names are, or how they live. I don't know their language, their habits and customs, their era, which is separated from mine, the beginnings of mankind, by eons that I can't even count in years. You've made your way through a number of reincarnations and have acquired a savoir vivre that lets you get along in any company. Have you any idea how I feel? A person by nature timid and embarrassed, who even back in the year 1930 never entered a strange living room without beads of sweat on his forehead. How am I to act? How am I to behave? The only aid to my nerves is the fact that I am invisible. You can't expose me to the friction of such a meeting after an eternity of solitary confinement. Don't worry, he smiled cheerfully. Your timidity, your embarrassment, stem from a cannibalistic civilization, 
a civilized Italian erected upon pagan taboos, where high and low, great and small, rich and poor, beautiful and ugly, were separated from each other by yawning chasms. I promise you, you will meet the friendliest, the handsomest, the most tactful people at this wedding party, and in just a few minutes. You see, there's just the last light green globule left to get into the last little hole marked, keenly directed desire. Please have some consideration, B.H., I begged, before it's too late. You simply can't let me plump into this world without any information or instructions. Maybe it would be best to call the whole thing off. Please, please, help me. Maybe you could let me disappear. You know, I'm proud. I don't want to make a fool of myself. No matter how painful this confession may be for the author of a travel book, at this moment my conceit, my pride, and my fear were greater than my curiosity and journalistic inquisitiveness. But B.H. paid no attention to me. He was having a little trouble getting the final globule into the final little hole and moving our objective toward us. Don't be nervous, he said without looking up. You won't feel a thing. By tonight you'll have your own instrument. And he took hold of my arm with his free hand, so that we formed a single unit. When the last globule finally dropped into the hole marked, keenly directed desire, there was a pleasant little snap, not one-tenth as distinct as the tiny electric shock that one got on clear winter days in New York when one shook hands. I now expected the distant horizon to rush silently but rapidly toward our stationary spot. Nothing of the sort happened. You had to be a keen observer to notice presently that the number, position, and arrangement of the big clumps of trees in the desolate plain about us had changed without any transition. One of these thick groves now was situated not more than fifteen feet from us. The waxy blossoms with their vague hints of color gleamed wanly from the black leathery foliage. We had reached our destination, or, to be more exact, our destination had reached us. We began to move our feet, B.H., his visible ones, I, my invisible ones. It was strangely pleasant to walk on the gray nap of this carpet of sod with which the entire aging globe seemed to be covered. Suddenly, I could no longer restrain myself. I stopped and shouted at B.H., I won't walk another step until you tell me what you mean by the grandiose, overwhelming event with which you don't want to frighten me. The Fourth Chapter Wherein I acquire information, enter the house of the wedding party, and make my appearance in the circle that summoned me. It was a perfectly ordinary day, B.H. began. A weekday, he broke off and frowned out across the marvelously kept lawn that miraculously covered the smooth earth from horizon. I felt that it cost my friend a tremendous effort to speak about the event. In order to make it easier for him, I continually interposed questions. For example, and you happened to be living again on this ordinary day, didn't you, B.H.? That's a question I can't always answer accurately, F.W., he answered sternly. Remember this. At times my personal experiences become confused with general historical knowledge in my consciousness. The event, however, really is my own experience, although at the same time it is the greatest general impression that the human race has ever had. You know that great impressions and severe wounds become perceptible only gradually, and that memory frequently tries to eject the recollection of the instant of the trauma. At any rate, it was just a day like any other. Forgive me, B.H., I interrupted again. Could you possibly fix the date of this ordinary weekday a bit more definitely? Well, if you insist on a date, he shrugged. It was an extremely cloudy Friday. Furthermore, as every child knows, it was the 13th of November dash. I have serious doubts that there could be a cloudy weekday nowadays, not to mention a genuine gray November Friday, I said, sniffing the strangely dry air and looking up to the naked unbroken blue of the sky. A very good observation, F.W., my friend approved. Clouds are a great rarity and highly appreciated by mental man. For heaven's sake, you're standing right in the middle of a metropolis, B.H. explained with some annoyance. But I assume, I jibed, that your metropolis on that 13th of November presented a somewhat different appearance. That goes without saying, my reincarnated friend countered my mild sarcasm. Of course it looked different, and a hundred years earlier and a hundred years later it looked different again. I've come a long way, you know, my friend. 
On that particular 13th of November, houses were still, or perhaps again, built above the ground. The mental bowl, to be sure, had not yet been devised. We did not move our objectives toward us, but we moved toward them with enormous and highly unsalubrious speed. You would have approved completely of that metropolis. We had to go through labyrinthine passages to get out into the street. Sidewalks and roadways were still archaically separate from each other. The traffic was terrific. Gyroplanes flew overhead. Their speed made them as invisible as you are now, FW down below, men, women, and children crowded around huge show windows behind which brilliant reviews and musical comedies were performed day and night by great artists. I even recollect the good old milkman whose little cart was drawn by a big dog hung with sleigh bells. It really was a pretty backward period. And it was raining, I tried to steer B.H. back to his subject. And it was raining, I tried to steer B.H. back to his subject. No, it wasn't raining, he said dreamily. It wasn't even drizzling. It was only very dark. Afterward, the newspapers claimed that an atmosphere of doom had prevailed before the event. Neither I nor any of my friends had noticed anything at all. Of course, I mustn't forget to mention that even the nature-blind metropolis noticed the terrible excitement of the birds. And when did the birds begin to get excited? LT was said to have started shortly after midnight. By a rare chance, I spent the night before the 13th at home. Millions and millions of birds invaded the metropolis of which I am speaking. Don't ask me what its name was. I simply don't remember it anymore. But you can ask me about the birds if you want. There were all varieties that were then in existence, from condors, vultures, hawks, cormorants, down to swallows, wrens, and sparrows. Those are all the names of birds that I can recall. Flat roofs, roof gardens, spires and towers, balustrades, antennas, metal frames for the reception of cosmic rays, trans-shadow disintegrator installations, everything was black, pitch black, with large and small birds. And there was a squawking and wailing and twittering that beggars description. It was a single, sharp, jagged cry of anguish that vibrated beneath the low-hanging clouds dash. And you call that a perfectly ordinary day, I said, shaking my head. So it was, not at BH, a perfectly ordinary weekday, a Friday, and a 13th of November. The first newspaper extras reported this matter of the birds as early as 2 o'clock in the morning. So did the various agencies that transmitted ether waves. The uranograph, carrot you'll find out presently what that is, hadn't been devised at that time. We were just in the middle of a highly rationalistic era and people had a more unquestioning faith in science than at any time in your experience. The learned institutes began to look into the matter without delay. By four o'clock in the morning, they had examined, analyzed, and explained the phenomenon. They reported that it was connected with some sort of electromagnetic disturbance that led to the formation of recurrent chain lightning in the lower strata of the atmosphere. LT looks less and less like an ordinary day to me, old man, I interjected, and I could feel my invisible shoulders shrug. Believe me, FW, with the exception of the bird cries, it was the most commonplace Friday imaginable. And how long does it take a self-respecting metropolis to get used to the most intense squawking and to go back about its business? Two or three hours. At 11.30, the world had become accustomed to it, and the headlines in the noon editions of the papers dealt with the marital troubles of a world-famed ventriloquist. And at 11.55? I asked. I had just begun to lather my face. B.H. replied thoughtfully. It was the hour when civilized working people of that generation got up. You know, one of the most definite facts that I learned in the course of many reincarnations is this. The more advanced mankind is, the later they get up. And at 12.20? I persisted. At 12.44, he said and took a long, deep breath. At 12.44, I left my comfortable living quarters in order to keep an appointment for luncheon. Incidentally, there isn't a speck of truth in the report that some joker of a historian circulated to the effect that we lived in very convenient parlor bed and bath coffins in those days. That sealed themselves up mechanically after our demise and lowered themselves automatically into the ground. That's a pack of lies. Our living quarters may have been pretty small, but they were as comfortable as an elastic glove. 
The times when men had to battle for a place in the sun and even more for a place in the shade were long past dash. It's at least 12.50 now, B.H., I urged him impatiently, for I had the feeling that he was trying to dodge the issue. You stepped out of your living quarters six minutes ago. I'm afraid you'll be late for lunch. In fact, I'll never get to this lunch at all, F.W. He smiled pensively. I will just manage to reach the city park right around the corner. You know I always preferred to travel on Shank's mare. So I had made up my mind to stroll leisurely over to my friends who had invited me. Of course, I didn't get very far. How can one, he asked the vacant space that I occupied, how can one casually say of an event that takes no time, or practically no time, at all, that it took place? Practically no time is as good as any other time, I declared. You mean to say that the event lasted only a fraction of a second, B.H.? Perhaps you could express that fraction in numbers. You bet I can, he replied and quickly wrote a whole series of zeros in the air with an emphatic one at the end. I don't know anything about it, I pondered, but it seems to me that such an infinitesimal fraction could scarcely be perceived by the senses dash. Scarcely be perceived by the senses, he repeated almost derisively. I assure you we all thought the event lasted an eternity. While it took place, time stood still. Behind the thick, heavy wall of clouds of that 13th of November there suddenly flamed the Empyrean, the heaven of fire which the ancients believed lay above all other heavens. How can I describe the indescribable? There was nothing, no city, no houses, no park, no boulevard, no trees, no eye, no you carrot nothing, nothing but light, light compared to which all known light is murky dusk. I have always feared, I murmured, deeply moved, that the sun might have a heart attack or a fit of insanity sometime. Call it what you will, he said. On that Friday, the 13th of November, the sun threatened to stampede. It's really not anything new. Other stars have been known to explode without warning, that is, to grow to a million times their former size. I don't know whether we learned about Nova formation when we were in school together, or whether that was a much later discovery. But the great thing about our sun is that, at the same time it stampeded, it restrained itself and remained its own master. In consequence, the result was not annihilation but the great event known as transparency. It can scarcely be called a physical occurrence. And yet, we experienced the day of judgment. It must have been terrible, I muttered mechanically, terrible. Terrible, he exclaimed. It was glorious, unspeakably glorious. If the brevity of the instant had been longer by one zero less, everything would have been over forever. If any creature on earth had had a lighted match in his hand during the transparency, the atmosphere would have ignited and puffed out into space in a banner of flame. Why? Because the oxygen content of the air was trebled for several seconds before and after the transparency. But fortunately, there were no more matches on earth at that time, and no open fires, not even streams of lava. There are still scientists today who claim that the increase of the oxygen content in the atmosphere was responsible for the divine rapture, the ineffable ecstasy that filled me and all other living beings in that fraction of time. How can I imagine, I marveled, that any sort of sensation can develop in such a fraction of time, B.H.? You can imagine that instant, F.W., to have been like the climactic intensification of a never-conceived symphonic movement. My God! Thaf's all nonsense, you can't imagine it at all. But try to imagine that until now you have lived only as a figure in a picture and suddenly you step from the canvas, living and three-dimensional. Or, imagine that what you have regarded as life until now is only a spasm, a crippling, stunning contraction of all muscles, and all at once you are freed from this spasm and are whole and straight. That's about how we felt during the transparency. You slept through a great deal. FW. I didn't ask to be wakened, I replied, illogically nettled. Do you really feel so uncomfortable in your cloak of invisibility? He asked, and I noticed that I had offended him. As I think over your clear account, B.H., I resumed, it was not so much a matter of an astronomical event that unfailingly led to destruction, as an infinitesimally brief hesitation on the part of the sun between continued shining and flaming self-annihilation an instant of balance, so to speak, 
on the edge of a knife that found expression in the light phenomenon which you or the scientists call transparency. Outside of that, however, it seems to have passed without any perceptible effect dash. It did have effects, he interrupted. The transparency was not a mere spectacle dash. But no physical or chemical effects, I interposed, except for the momentary increase of the atmospheric oxygen. You're wrong, said B.H. The event had a considerable number of physical effects. The fact that a few hundred thousand people died during the transparency is of no particular consequence. But look up at the sky, F.W., and you'll see some of the effects, or to be more exact, you'll not see them. Obediently, I looked up at the radiant sky. It appeared much emptier, much quieter, than during my lifetime. Suddenly, I felt a brief, curious shock. Where are the birds? I asked. The class of birds is gone since that Friday, the 13th of November, he replied with a sort of dragging solemnity, and then he added, their fright and their rapture were too great. They did not survive the event. B.H. had nothing further to say. He walked toward the dark clump of trees that stood a few steps away. After a quick, distrustful look at the sun, I followed him. Now that I should really turn my flying pin loose on the actual description of my travels in the mental or astromental time and world, I feel retarded, and, worse than that, I retard my fretting, and by this time, perhaps fuming, reader with me. I am conscientiously searching my memory, and yet I can't be quite certain how much advance information about this time and world BH revealed to me before we entered the house of the wedding party. Now, I mean right now as I write. When a few days and nights have elapsed since my return home, it seems to me that my friend was prevailed upon to give me a few scanty details before he made a slight bow in front of a tree-shaded garden gate and softly said, We are here, into the void beyond, whereupon the gate opened. But perhaps I am wrong. Perhaps my reincarnated friend, who had so eloquently described the transparency, or sunk catastrophe, kept me in the dark before he introduced me to his friends. B.H. was certainly not as eager to be of service to me as Virgil was to Dante, to make a very presumptuous comparison. In spite of our friendship, a sort of suppressed rivalry he existed between us. Like every true Cicerone, B.H. wanted to see me, the tourist, in a constant dither of astonishment. And I, like every tourist, stubbornly resisted his efforts and preferred frequently against my own will, to appear indifferent and blasé. The result was that B.H. was often offended and withheld his instruction from me. So I learned a good many unexpected facts without any explanation, through penetration and osmosis, I can't think of any better words. By the simple fact of my presence in it, this unknown world and time permeated me with a surprisingly rapid understanding of its peculiarities and immeasurable changes. This alone accounts for the fact that a very brief sojourn, measured in hours, furnished me enough material to render this circumstantial report. Yet this report represents only a selection from the abundance of things I saw, experienced, and knew, recorded as nearly as possible in chronological order. Partly because I doubt the reliability of my memory and partly because I am afraid to tire my reader with too many novelties. B.H. had managed to conjure up before my mind's eye such a glorious picture of the stupendous celestial phenomenon of the transparency that it suddenly seemed to me, as I shyly looked up at the sun, that I had experienced it myself, that I had been there in body and spirit, although it had actually taken place several decamillennia before my visit, during the deepest depth of my sleep of death. It had been a reliable instinct that prompted me to insist upon being initiated into this phenomenon before passing over the threshold of the nuptial house. The increased importance of a wedding, the tying of the conjugal knot, was somehow connected with the sublime transparency. Since our sun had suffered its attack, that infinitesimal instant between shining permanence and explosive annihilation, which could so easily have reconverted our entire planetary system into most rarefied original matter. Since that moment of moments a number of transformations had taken place in our poor, dear earth that were not less important than the disappearance of the birds. Although the moment of moments had been so brief that B.H. had hardly been able to write enough zeros in the air to define its brevity, 
it had been sufficient to produce a slight increase of the distance between the terrestrial globe and the sun. It was a totally insignificant increase that lengthened the Earth's orbit, and with it the year, by an hour or two. Still this tiny expansion was reflected in the history of nature and of mankind, as was also the slightly retarded axial rotation of the Earth which increased the 24 hours of the day to a similarly tiny degree by a handful of seconds. Untutored layman that I am, I merely report these changes without being able to describe, confirm, or justify them astronomically or physically. It will be up to the scientists to test the facts I brought home with me. But the most skeptical scientist will not exclude the probability that even insignificant cosmic, astronomical changes are bound to have biological consequences. And I can't avoid blurting out in quite unseemly fashion the most important of these consequences as they affected the crowning work of creation. This was a very considerable increase in the span of human life. Whether this was due solely to the lengthening and slowing of the planetary rhythm, or whether an ingenious reduction of the perils and malignities to which the flesh used to be heir was a contributing factor. This too is a question that I will have to put upon the shoulders of the scientists. A certain shy embarrassment forces me to protract the moment of respite at the garden gate of the astromental era. Once we have entered, it will be my difficult task to deal with an overpowering copiousness of grandiose progress that has nothing whatever in common with technical improvements and labor-saving devices, which we, in the beginnings of mankind, identified almost exclusively with the word progress. This naive and straightforward word encompasses a gross illusion, a fact with which even the less intelligent have now become familiar. The bee-like industry of the changing generations leaves behind many a honey drop of experience in the combs, which neither sun and earth catastrophes nor mankind's partial loss of memory can completely waste. Every clock that strikes the hours is a savings bank in which the accumulating seconds do not melt away entirely without interest. For living and suffering humanity time itself stores up a certain capital that, to be sure, can be cashed only at great intervals in the form of a tiny annuity, as though by the last will of a far-sighted, penurious testator. Thus every generation is a tiny bit richer than its predecessor, even though only by the frustrations of the latter. This microscopic plus value of increasing age is the only progress of mankind. I do not disavow this thesis, even though I listen to an entirely contrary dogma from the lips of the Grand Bishop on the second day of my visit. The truth remains the same. The points of view are different. The age of the people into whose midst I was about to step, for the reader's peace of mind we were already inside the garden gate, could be extended without any trouble to the 200th year. It was customary for most people, however, to go into retirement, some 20 or 30 years earlier, although old age entailed no inconveniences except perhaps a certain amount of boredom and surfeit. In this respect, however, I am prematurely approaching the second, if not the most important, experience of my visit. And it would be more than awkward from the point of view of the reporter as well as of the novelist to divulge this experience together with the meaning of the hypocritical word, Wintergarden. Before the twenty-second chapter in the third part of this chronicle, the general extension and retardation of life had brought with them a number of other peculiarities, some of which I guessed, and with some of which B.H. acquainted me, at least so it seems to me now. Before we came in contact with the people who had invited, or rather summoned, me to their wedding feast, it certainly did not require much acumen to perceive the impoverishment of life's diversity and profuseness, the remarkable curtailment of its variety, and the abatement of its passions. One glance out at the smooth desolation of the countryside was sufficient. So far we hadn't met a single human being. The conclusion I drew from this fact, confirmed by my friend, was correct. The former total of billions of contemporaneously living individuals had shrunk, or had been reduced, to the absolute minimum necessary for the preservation of the species. The next link in the logical chain followed inevitably, with such sparse population of the leveled globe, with communication simplified in the extreme by the travel puzzle, national and linguistic differences could no longer exist. Humanity had been united since time immemorial. But perhaps I am wrong. Perhaps my reincarnated friend, who had so eloquently described the transparency, or sunk catastrophe, 
kept me in the dark before he introduced me to his friends. B.H. was certainly not as eager to be of service to me as Virgil was to Dante, to make a very presumptuous comparison. In spite of our friendship, a sort of suppressed rivalry he existed between us. Like every true Cicerone, B.H. wanted to see me, the tourist, in a constant dither of astonishment. And I, like every tourist, stubbornly resisted his efforts and preferred, frequently against my own will, to appear indifferent and blasé. The result was that B.H. was often offended and withheld his instruction from me. So I learned a good many unexpected facts without any explanation, through penetration and osmosis, I can't think of any better words. By the simple fact of my presence in it, this unknown world and time permeated me with a surprisingly rapid understanding of its peculiarities and immeasurable changes. This alone accounts for the fact that a very brief sojourn, measured in hours, furnished me enough material to render this circumstantial report. Yet this report represents only a selection from the abundance of things I saw, experienced, and knew, recorded as nearly as possible in chronological order. Partly because I doubt the reliability of my memory and partly because I am afraid to tire my reader with too many novelties. B.H. had managed to conjure up before my mind's eye such a glorious picture of the stupendous celestial phenomenon of the transparency that it suddenly seemed to me, as I shyly looked up at the sun, that I had experienced it myself, that I had been there in body and spirit, although it had actually taken place several decamillennia before my visit, during the deepest depth of my sleep of death. It had been a reliable instinct that prompted me to insist upon being initiated into this phenomenon before passing over the threshold of the nuptial house. The increased importance of a wedding, the tying of the conjugal knot, was somehow connected with the sublime transparency. Since our sun had suffered its attack, that infinitesimal instant between shining permanence and explosive annihilation, which could so easily have reconverted our entire planetary system into most rarefied original matter. Since that moment of moments a number of transformations had taken place in our poor, dear Earth that were not less important than the disappearance of the birds. Although the moment of moments had been so brief that B.H. had hardly been able to write enough zeros in the air to define its brevity, it had been sufficient to produce a slight increase of the distance between the terrestrial globe and the sun. It was a totally insignificant increase that lengthened the Earth's orbit, and with it the year, by an hour or two. Still this tiny expansion was reflected in the history of nature and of mankind, as was also the slightly retarded axial rotation of the Earth which increased the 24 hours of the day to a similarly tiny degree by a handful of seconds. Untutored layman that I am, I merely report these changes without being able to describe, confirm, or justify them astronomically or physically. It will be up to the scientists to test the facts I brought home with me. But the most skeptical scientist will not exclude the probability that even insignificant cosmic, astronomical changes are bound to have biological consequences. And I can't avoid blurting out in quite unseemly fashion the most important of these consequences as they affected the crowning work of creation. This was a very considerable increase in the span of human life. Whether this was due solely to the lengthening and slowing of the planetary rhythm or whether an ingenious reduction of the perils and malignities to which the flesh used to be air was a contributing factor. This too is a question that I will have to put upon the shoulders of the scientists. A certain shy embarrassment forces me to protract the moment of respite at the garden gate of the astromental era. Once we have entered, it will be my difficult task to deal with an overpowering copiousness of grandiose progress that has nothing whatever in common with technical improvements and labor-saving devices, which we, in the beginnings of mankind, identified almost exclusively with the word progress. This naive and straightforward word encompasses a gross illusion, a fact with which even the less intelligent have now become familiar. The bee-like industry of the changing generations leaves behind many a honey drop of experience in the combs, which neither sun and earth catastrophes nor mankind's partial loss of memory can completely waste. Every clock that strikes the hours is a savings bank in which the accumulating seconds do not melt away entirely without interest. For living and suffering humanity time itself stores up a certain capital that, to be sure, can be cashed only at great intervals in the form of a tiny annuity, 
as though by the last will of a far-sighted, penurious testator. Thus every generation is a tiny bit richer than its predecessor, even though only by the frustrations of the latter. This microscopic plus value of increasing age is the only progress of mankind. I do not disavow this thesis, even though I listen to an entirely contrary dogma from the lips of the Grand Bishop on the second day of my visit. The truth remains the same. The points of view are different. The age of the people into whose midst I was about to step, for the reader's peace of mind we were already inside the garden gate, could be extended without any trouble to the two hundredth year. It was customary for most people, however, to go into retirement, some twenty or thirty years earlier, although old age entailed no inconveniences except perhaps a certain amount of boredom and surfeit. In this respect, however, I am prematurely approaching the second, if not the most important, experience of my visit. And it would be more than awkward from the point of view of the reporter as well as of the novelist to divulge this experience together with the meaning of the hypocritical word Wintergarden. Before the twenty-second chapter in the third part of this chronicle, the general extension and retardation of life had brought with them a number of other peculiarities, some of which I guessed, and with some of which B.H. acquainted me, at least so it seems to me now. Before we came in contact with the people who had invited, or rather summoned, me to their wedding feast, it certainly did not require much acumen to perceive the impoverishment of life's diversity and profuseness, the remarkable curtailment of its variety, and the abatement of its passions. One glance out at the smooth desolation of the countryside was sufficient. So far we hadn't met a single human being. The conclusion I drew from this fact, confirmed by my friend, was correct. The former total of billions of contemporaneously living individuals had shrunk, or had been reduced, to the absolute minimum necessary for the preservation of the species. The next link in the logical chain followed inevitably, with such sparse population of the leveled globe, with communication simplified in the extreme by the travel puzzle, national and linguistic differences could no longer exist. Humanity had been united since time immemorial. On the one hand, B.H. was anxious to keep me in a state of astonishment. On the other hand, however, he didn't want me to make a fool of myself by appearing to my new contemporaries as a complete ignoramus. For this reason he expounded to me, somewhat rudely, the meaning of a wedding in the mental world, and why it was a great social honor to be invited to this festival. The area in which the change produced by the transparency was most clearly reflected was, of course, that of reproduction, copulation, procreation, conception, pregnancy, in short, the entire process of propagation. It was not true, B.H. admitted, that all women were capable of becoming pregnant only once in their lives. That applied only to the most aristocratic and refined class among them. Like the wonderful trees in the fairy tale, they could bear fruit only once. On the other hand, the general refinement of nature was evidenced by the fact that the period of gestation had increased from nine months to almost twelve. Even though monopedia, the one-child system, was the rule, exceptions, B.H. declared with grave mien, were more frequent than the rule. Unfortunately, I could not discover the percentage of families that raised two or three children. The mania for statistics that had been typical of my own age seemed to have disappeared completely in the mental era. But one thing was quite clear from the intimations of my reincarnated friend. Anyone who came of a prolific family, that is, one that had as many as two scions, could not be said to be of good family. The prolific families thus formed the lower class of society, although the term lower class sounded absurd in a world that had neither economic nor social distinctions, as B.H. maintained in the same breath. At any rate, he did not conceal the fact that the monopedic patriciate did not mingle with the proliferous bourgeoisie. It hadn't taken me long to figure out the tremendous significance of matrimony in this era. It had been raised almost to a level of sacramental holiness, as it had in the Catholic Church, one of the two institutions from the beginnings of mankind that I was to meet in this world. The second will be divulged at the proper time. As for the union of man and woman, there was much less free erotic choice than in the liberal era of my earlier life. 
Again, there was a meeting of extremes, for the mental people of this most remote future had the same customs in this respect as the superstitious peasants of most remote antiquity. At a very tender age, the male child had his bride assigned to him. The choice was, to a large extent, preordained by certain external characteristics and inner qualities of the children. Among the external characteristics, I include the indications that were manifested by the stars. In the eons that had passed, man's relations to the cosmos of the stars had radically changed. I really have to hold myself in check to avoid speaking at this early date of the most overwhelming of my travel experiences that resulted from the new relation of astromental men to the cosmos of the stars. They understood more fully than we could ever imagine the relation of every point in the cosmos to every other point in the cosmos, and the extent to which all mundane things depend upon this unbroken tissue of interrelations. The word horoscope is much too crude. It sounds far too much like mechanical, amateur fortune-telling even to suggest the sidereal subtleties and finenesses that were invoked to protect the maturing spouses physically, mentally, and morally. On this basis, their place of residence was regulated, their instruction, their play, their recreation, even their sleep. The youth and the young girl were permitted to meet only three times, at specific turning points in their lives, before the betrothal. These three meetings were tests to ascertain whether perhaps a secret perversity, a hidden antipathy, an unexpected aversion, threatened to destroy the carefully planned alliance. Such cases of incompatibility occurred occasionally, but the agreement was then broken at once and the world had something to gossip about. It was better that they had something to gossip about now than later, which means that even in the astromental world there were such things as love tragedies, adultery, and divorce, only they caused incomparably deeper suffering than in our world. But if everything went well, it was only necessary to await the 33rd birthday of the bridegroom when he reached the legally prescribed age of maturity. The hour for the wedding had come. This hour was, of course, preceded by months of preparation. These consisted of instruction, contemplation, self-examination, and short of psychic moral exercises, to which the prospective spouses were separately subjected in order to make them tractable for the sacrifice of personality without which true wedlock is inconceivable. When these exercises had been finished to the satisfaction of examiner and examinee, the festival proper began, a true festival in every sense, that lasted for three days, the greater part of which was celebrated in the bridal house, the smaller part in public. The ceremony itself took place at noon of the third day. Mention of this schedule is essential, since it forms the framework of my short but profitable sojourn in a future of which I never even dreamed. It is for the sake of this schedule that I am compelled to interrupt so near the source the hitherto scanty flow of my narrative. But I pledge here and now that, unlike other traveling pedants, I shall not hamper the unconfined fancy of my readers by means of maps, sketches, or any other sort of illustration. This is the first day of the nuptial feast of Lodu and LOLA, said B.H., carefully closing the gate behind him. Too bad you missed the forenoon. Asterisk with these words, he began to move ahead slowly. I continued to stand firmly on my invisible but solid legs. A little stubbornly, I asked, What business have I at the nuptials of the distinguished couple Lodu and LOLA? But you're a special feature in their honor, F.W. Asterisk, my friend replied without turning around. Don't you understand? I understood. The apparition of a creature from darkest antiquity was B.H.'s wedding gift to the young couple on the first day of the festivity. In former days, they used to make presents of apes, parrots, dwarfs, and court jesters. Today, they gave summoned spirits. Why not? Of course, it was still a question what they would do with an invisible ghost. Despite my state, I had hot shivers. I was about to make a cutting remark when B.H. said softly, his back still turned to me. And I hope you understand that I wanted chiefly to give you a special present. His voice sounded warm and sincere. He had indeed given me a gift that embraced all other gifts within it, namely life and consciousness. Torn between gratitude and annoyance, I fixed my eye on the scene about me. The garden through which I followed my friend was a real garden, although only by courtesy. It consisted of actual hedges, bushes, shrubs, beds, and a fountain, 
surrounded by gray sod, and all that was overshadowed by dense treetops with leathery black foliage that were characteristic of the flat country all around. Which B.H. claimed to be a metropolis, so far I couldn't tell why. The beds, shrubs, and hedges in the garden didn't show a speck of green, and they were covered in modest abundance with flowers that were utterly strange to me. There were five or six varieties at most. The majority of them resembled very large anemones with very faint tints, pink, yellowish, heliotrope, and iridescent mother-of-pearl. Only one shrub blossom that appeared to correspond to our rose showed a decided, strong, dull-color carrot rust red. But it too had an artificial aspect with its thick, motionless petals, as though manufactured by a wax chandler. I hop forward to think of a luxury shop in Paris, near the Gare saint Lazare happy face whose show windows, filled with a wealth of such artificial flowers, magically captivated the eye. But the difference was that in those show windows art was trying to appear natural while here, in these bushes and beds, nature was apparently making a valiant attempt to look as artificial and unreal as possible. In its entirety, this medium-sized garden with all its pale-tinted plants and with its black leafy roof of strange, somber trees gave me the impression of shrinking from light and fearing the sun. This was all the more remarkable since I had the definite sensation that the sun had lost some of its radiant heat but had, at the same time, gained in penetrating brilliance and dazzling glare. Later experience asterisk justified my suspicions, this fear of the sun, this shrinking from its radiation, was a natural protective instinct as well as a conviction among these astromental people. Now I noticed a lot of large, I might almost say enormous, pale-winged butterflies and light green dragonflies that hovered with vibrant wings over the plants. As they soared, they produced a pleasing chirping sound, almost a melodious twittering. The butterflies are singing, said B.H. with a radiant smile. There are songbirds. It's April Dash. You're a renegade, B.H., I blurted out. Although I said nothing further, I felt as though he had sold his parents because he appeared so perfectly at home in this strange world without birds and green grass. But I was carried back to the days before I had fallen asleep to waken without warning on the gray-haired sod of this remote future about which I am writing in the past tense. I saw the garden of my little house, with the graceful stone basin that was always kept filled with water for the birds. Golden orioles and blackbirds and blue nuthatches darted in from all directions, drank and bathed and darted away again. And all that went through my mind and filled me with sadness. Then I looked up at the blue, dead, empty sky of this day and contemplated the cheerless, strange garden about me and wondered how any sort of plants could thrive in such a shadowy existence, even though they were only wax and candy blossoms that didn't move. Of course, B.H. divined my thoughts at once. The gardening is done by a central agency, he explained. The worker does all that. The worker? What's that? I asked, unable to conceal my startled surprise. He is also called the bearded one or the sleepless one, B.H. replied. But patience, old man, you'll see him. But the thing I didn't see was the house. B.H. had not deceived me. We were really standing in the middle of a city. But, because of the previously mentioned fear of the sun, the houses of this city were not built above, but deep down under, the ground. Each garden crowned with leathery black foliage was therefore a roof garden. Each individual clump of trees designated a dwelling. Nothing could be more diametrically opposed to the scientific architecture of concrete, steel, and glass, the industrialized architecture of my day and the beginnings of mankind that loved to drag screaming light and glaring noise into the nerveless dwelling cubes. Then this building practice which fashioned a protective home for hypersensitive humans in the bosom of the earth. The only thing visible above the surface was a moderately tall, round superstructure of translucent material that resembled a gun turret or observation tower of a battleship. We entered this tower through a doorless aperture, whereupon the platform on which we stood immediately began to sink. At the same instant, and nobody can blame me for it, I had violent palpitations of the heart. For that reason I was very glad when, upon our arrival down below, B.H. asked me to wait because he had to announce my arrival. When I was finally in the reception room, I can't say whether I had been called or fetched, 
I was quite calm again and brimming with the impartial attentiveness and brazen curiosity of a genuine explorer. Although I really didn't become quite aware of this purpose of my nocturnal mission until after my return home. Of course, my task wasn't as easy as one might suppose. I could not, for example, comply with the explorer's obvious obligation to keep stenographic notes in a little memorandum book, namely because of the peculiar light that pervaded this medium-sized and well-proportioned room. This light, or rather this illumination, was neither faint nor gloomy. It was, quite on the contrary, of a comfortable, mild brightness. But by some admixture that was new to me it succeeded not only in illuminating but also in softening the outlines of all objects, in making them pleasantly indistinct and attractively remote. If the word aristocratic can be used of any sort of illumination, then this was the most aristocratic illumination imaginable. I have purposely used the word aristocratic instead of aesthetic because the illumination lent tact and charm to all objects. Fairly warm, with a yellowish, mellow tinge, it reminded me of the Wellsback gaslight of my childhood and of the serene family circle. Bathed in this domestic illumination, about ten or eleven persons stood about a strangely high, moderately large table that made me think of some creature caught unawares and playing possum. The people smiled with great satisfaction in my direction. They were not holding hands, nor had the room been darkened as the practice of a long dead era prescribed. Such hocus-pocus seemed to have become passé ages ago. Outside the homely circle of light, exactly halfway between these persons and me, stood the reincarnated B.H. Although his face was in the shadow, he somehow reminded me of an interlocutor, or a performer, or a barker in a freak show, who had just said something particularly striking. With one hand, B.H. pointed at me, voila, with the other, at the company. From now on, this was his symbolic gesture. The people who stood there looking at me attentively, candidly, and expectantly were no clothing except the delicate lace tissue that the strange light without a source cast over them. Or in simpler words, they were naked. I, on the other hand, was no longer naked, let alone nakeder than naked, invisible. On the contrary, I was extremely visible to my own discomfort. And to cap the climax I was wearing, horrible idea, I was wearing my dress suit with a stiff, badly dented shirt front, wilted stand-up collar, and dejected white tie. I had probably been buried in this ceremonial costume more than a hundred thousand years ago, and even then this tail coat had been, well, I won't exaggerate, but it had been nearly twenty years old. Next to its shabby lapel dangled the only medal that I had received in my life. It had been awarded by an art-loving but feeble government that was booted out of existence just three weeks after the rash bestowal of the decoration. What a curious exchange of roles. I, who had been summoned here as a ghostly body, as an ectoplasmic apparition, felt like the fat head waiter of a second-rate restaurant in the company of radiant spirits. But they received me with wide, satisfied eyes, for my superannuated dress suit no doubt looked to them like a fantastic costume from the masquerade wardrobe of human antiquity. Far more fantastic, certainly, than a knight in full armor and plumed crest would have appeared to me in my day. Anyone who has ever entered a circle of people of a very strange race knows how painfully difficult it is to tell them apart and to find differences in their faces. Generally, he tries to find differentiating characteristics in their physical build and in their dress. I could do neither. The persons about the table appeared to be of uniform build, of graceful, I might almost say dainty, figures, men and women alike. Their harmonious medium size refuted the customary concept of the gigantic, strong-willed race of the future, a notion that I too had in my time. And their dress was of as little help to me as their build. Even though these carrot people wore the peculiar illumination like a light, loose house dress about their bodies, still it served to efface rather than to emphasize any differences. From the very start I felt that the nakedness of these figures had nothing in common with the nakedness or semi-nakedness that used to parade on the beaches in our days of bathing beauties. That really wasn't nakedness at all, but undressedness, unclothing of what was ordinarily clothed. This nakedness, however, was genuine nakedness. It was not at odds with itself. It could be regarded as the traditional costume at home. It did not have the hidden desire to attract attention and care it to arouse lust. It was innocent. 
If I were an ardent sectarian, I could perhaps speak of the regained paradisiac nakedness. The old ivory color of these mental bodies, with no hint of cream and roses, of itself revealed and disseminated a sensuous coolness that is hard to describe. The beauty of the delicately formed and fine-featured persons in the room did not, however, have the entrancing quality that we describe by the term radiant beauty. The inescapable force that attracts the breathless beholder and makes him thirst as it refreshes him. No one here was radiantly beautiful. They were sternly beautiful or mildly beautiful or transparently beautiful. But since they were all beautiful, my eyes had no standard of comparison, the basis of all rank, and so they speedily became accustomed to all this unaccustomed beauty. Added to this was eternal youth, or rather agelessness, one of the great accomplishments of recent eons. At first, I took each of the couples present for the bridal couple, Lodu and Lola. But very soon I was informed that tradition and custom, ritual and secret hygiene, prevented the bridal couple from mingling freely with the wedding guests present in the house. They lay on couches in their separate apartments, near each other and yet distant from each other, indulging in contemplation, reverie, and introspection. The men and women whom I had taken for the betrothed couple were the parents and grandparents of the bride and those of the bridegroom. The grandparents did not appear older by a single wrinkle than the parents, and I never saw anything more youthfully vigorous than the cheerful parents. If any difference in ages was apparent, it was only in the depth of the eye sockets. To observe that, however, required a more intimate acquaintance with this present which, as I write these words, has again become most remote future. But stop. Inexpert reporter that I am, in the analysis of my own impressions I almost forgot to mention an important external circumstance. There was a difference, and a very striking one at that. The people assembled here, these graceful individuals, wore wigs. Within the hectomillennium that had elapsed, nature had apparently ordained the disappearance of human hair. This trivial biological mutation, as anyone will admit, is not even remotely comparable to the abyss that yawns between the Neanderthal caveman and, let's say, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The former also had to lose the wool from his pelt before he developed into the latter. The coevalist before whom I had just materialized, please get this, Carrot had no hair either on their bodies or their faces. What a saving of time and energy for the men who didn't even need a mental razor. As for hair on top of the head, of course, if I want to be quite honest, I can't say whether they had any or not. And I'm trying hard to be quite honest. I simply couldn't find out. The wigs prevented me. But even these wigs did not consist of hair. Hair was regarded as contemptible, as atavistically disgusting. It didn't take me long to discover that, and I was terribly embarrassed because I had no head covering of any kind. The wigs were actually only stylized headdresses made of faintly luminous material in gold and silver. They were reminiscent of the formal headdresses of Greek tragedians or of the surrealist waves of daring show window dummies of an era which, from my present vantage point, was not much later. The matter of the wigs, as I found out a little later, was regulated by law. Up to the age of 120, people were permitted to wear golden wigs. After that, silver was in order. But the ladies were still feminine enough to play a clever game of back and forth between silver and gold when advancing age, from 120 on, made it necessary. Well, there I stood in my shabby burial suit, on my breast the medal of a snug little two-by-four country that had gone to the dogs while I was still living. My outward form had gone through various stages of solidification from its original state of invisibility, so that it was no longer ectoplasm or a ghostly body. Both spiritually and physically, I had become so completely, I myself, that, to be honest about it, I was perspiring with excitement. I recognized myself when I listened to myself or touched my face with my fingers. My tongue again came in contact with the gold tooth in the left upper comber. I noticed that B.H. was making embarrassed faces. Timidly, how could I help it? I approached this company that was so far ahead of me in cultural development and good manners. The time had come for me to appear, in compliance with their wish, a near troglodyte in dilapidated condition, that is, fat, sweating, and in a boiled shirt. They all smiled with pleasure at the sound of my old schoolmate's voice.
which carried a note of triumph under its ceremonious hoarseness. I have the honor, ladies and gentlemen, to present our esteemed guest, F.W., from the beginnings of mankind. At these words, the oldest man in the assembly turned to me and bowed. The superlative doesn't mean a thing. He could as easily have been the youngest. During the social conversation that followed, I learned that he was the so-called spokesman. In smaller households, B.H. informed me later, the spokesman and the house sage were one person. In this important house, however, there was, in addition to the spokesman and the house sage, even a third individual, who was called the permanent guest. These male officials were drawn from the reserve of bachelors which had been accumulated as a result of the strict marriage regulations. The bachelors lived along, and in this manner a social problem was smoothly solved. We welcome you to our unassuming present day, senior. The spokesman greeted me. He let the Baroque vocable senior melt on his tongue. It seemed that they had agreed to call me senior, not only to honor me, but also to use this form of address as a familiar bridge to my own era, a form of address that was calculated to flatter me. The good fellow imagined at a distance of a hundred thousand years that the people in the beginnings of mankind, from the Neanderthal man, let's say, through Nebuchadnezzar to Mussolini, had scattered seniors all over the place. He was puffed up with the pride of a philologist who has finally found an opportunity to use an extremely dead language, like Sumerian, perhaps, in practical dialogue with an ancient Sumerian. As it turned out, I had no reason at all to poke fun at the handsome patriarch and spokesman, for in the next moment I committed a horrible faux pas. I stepped up to this patriarch and extended my hand with an obscure mutter of acknowledgement of his greeting. But it happened that the custom of handshaking had been in disuse for Ian's, a fact of which B.H. should have apprised me at the time of our meeting when I tried to shake his hand. Worse than that, all physical contact was taboo in this highly sensitive era, just as hair was taboo. And so there was a little pause of startled confusion, as though the frivolously summoned primitive man in his uncouth manner had begun his visit on a discordant note, like the shriek of a slate pencil on a slate. For a tenth of a second, everyone squeezed his eyes shut. But a moment later, they all tried to cover up my faux pas and make me forget it. Especially the ladies smiled encouragingly in the strange light that blurred their lovely faces and figures. One of the ladies addressed me, and her question was the same embarrassed question they used to ask back in the old days. Is this your first trip to California? No, madam, I replied truthfully, perspiring profusely with the psychic exertion. Some time ago, I lived here for a few years. How interesting. As a cowboy or as a goal hunter, she queried archly and at the same time indifferently, parading her prehistoric knowledge with a slight note of vanity. No, madam, I said. Neither as a cowboy nor as a goal hunter, not even in the movies, but simply as a refugee. I ransacked the pockets of my dress suit for a handkerchief and finally found one that wasn't clean because I had forgotten to send it to the laundry. I wadded up the handkerchief in my hand so they wouldn't see it too plainly and began to wipe my forehead in mortification. At the same time, I was annoyed that a lady who had the privilege of seeing such a strange apparition should be far less excited than the apparition itself. She resumed the conversation with no indifferent blandness and adroitness of a conversing grand duchess or a debutante. Do you find our California changed, senior? To some extent, I lisped but I don't want to express an opinion too soon. In the course of this insignificant interlude, I became sharply aware that it was the most earnest endeavor of these people to avoid all embarrassment, all conflicts, all exertions, all arguments, all decisions, all serious troubles. This human race, in contrast to that of our time, had, in the course of countless generations, created an order, a mode of life, in which all resistance to the beautiful, the pleasing, the agreeable, the flattering seemed to have been broken. They did not feel the desolation all around and up above outside their house and their homely light. They knew nothing of green trees and green grass. Their grass was iron gray. But so far I had no idea how much they worried about their gracious convention of an agreeable and comfortable life, which they had not bought cheaply but at the cost of great denunciation, as the recipe of all culture requires. In search of help I looked around for B.H. A double door opened. The Fifth Chapter
wherein I partake of a festive meal, am addressed by a dog, and innocently broach a delicate subject. We walk through a double door into an adjoining chamber suffused with a somewhat brighter light, in very much the same manner as any gathering of guests used to do back in the days of antiquity when dinner was announced. To my astonishment, the room with the big center table was not the dining room, but this one here, completely bare of a table and even of seating accommodations, served that purpose. In the middle of the room, surrounded by a low, circular railing, a reddishly lustrous piece of sculpture projected from a shallow cavity. It was an abstract work of art representing no recognizable form of life. It could perhaps best be described as a twin crystal inclined at a sweetly sentimental angle, in such a manner that the larger crystal rose above the smaller one as a mother above the child in her lap. And the more I looked at it, the more I became convinced that the abstract work of art represented the Madonna and child, a theme for which a hundred thousand years are as a day. As I concentrated on the piece of sculpture, it actually seemed to become ever clearer, more distinct, more beautiful in its form. It obviously possessed the quality of transforming, transfiguring, and intensifying the impression it produced upon the observer in the course of his observation. I resolved at once to pay no attention to this work of art and on no account to become involved in a discussion of art. For, in the first place, it was much too soon for this subject at the present stage of my voyage of discovery. In the second place, I was surrounded by far too much genuine life to devote my interest to reflected life. And in the third place, I was vain enough to believe that I would not learn much of anything new in the realm of art. Moreover, I had no memorandum book other than my feeble memory upon which I did not wish to inscribe too many details. I was quite willing to devote my entire attention to the people about me. As we had entered this new room with its clearer and more revealing light, these delicately formed, naked persons had been handed soft, light-colored, filmy materials, which they now draped gracefully about their bodies, almost in the manner of certain Greek and Roman statues. B.H. had somehow managed to maneuver his way to my side. In sharp, hasty whispers he commented that no greater honor could be bestowed upon a guest than an invitation to a formal meal. Eating, he said, as far as it was only a matter of food and its enjoyment, was regarded as a completely private activity. In fact, eating was considered as private a pursuit as its opposite. Banquets, meals at which guests were entertained, were rarely arranged oftener than twelve times per year and then only for some sacramental or ceremonial purpose, a holiday or baptism, a wedding or departure. For the first time, I noticed that instead of the simple word death, B.H. used the stilted euphemism, departure. The custom of the religious sacrificial meal, I thought to myself, seems not only to have maintained itself, but actually appears to be more vital than in my time, the time before my death, and I thought the word death literally as though out of defiance. B.H. kept looking at me with an uneasy expression in his soft, dark eyes that I remembered so well from our long past school days. I realized that he was not playing an easy role. He was an outsider himself, a state to which his sensitive spirit seemed to have condemned him as long as I had known him. His very appearance and costume, field uniform and wrapped puttees, proved that he did not belong in the current era. On the other hand, however, he was the medium the mediator between this current era and the infinitely remote time before my death. It was he who had given these pleasant people the unusual enjoyment of communing with a departed spirit from the distant past, and not only in ghostly form, but in perfectly good shape, complete with dress suit and metal. As an agent who represented two parties at the same time, he obviously felt responsible for both. He showed signs of nervousness whenever I opened my mouth or made the slightest move since he expected me at any moment to make a social blunder. I really could not blame him for his anxiety, for his future might well depend on the success of this undertaking. If my appearance aroused satisfaction, approval, sympathy, not to say cordiality, if I inspired my hosts with the pleasant feeling that they, in their modernity, had far outstripped the ancient world from which their visitor had dropped in then his position as an outsider would be materially improved. After the successful completion of this visit, he could probably live in hopes of a somewhat warmer attitude and eventually complete acceptance on the part of his contemporaries. 
With a shade of dissatisfaction, I observed that my Tibetan-trained, reincarnated friend treated the group about us with a trifle too much humility and obsequiousness, and thus willfully accentuated their superiority over our common former age. This, however, was only one side of his nervous seal, for he was no less anxious to impress me, the partner of his youth, the companion of countless drinking bouts and heated debates into the early dawn. With the superior qualities of a world into which he had willy-nilly enticed, summoned, and introduced me out of the sleep of death, I was well acquainted with this trait of his character. In many a conversation back in our days his eyes used to beg me to serve as gods, to accept and acknowledge the worth of a dogma, a book, a picture, an author, a composition, that he held high. And so poor B.H. was torn between the interests of the beginning and the end of an eon, the poles of a hundred thousand years. Loraza, the mother of the bride, now invited the guests to dinner with a graceful, somewhat formalized gesture. I cannot say how I became aware of the names of the persons present. The connecting links of my experiences sometimes become a little blurred. I did as all the others. We stood in a circle about the piece of sculpture. Festive meals were consumed in a standing position. In this fact, too, a thoughtful historian might discern a logical development. The ancient peoples, including the Greeks and Romans, had stretched out on divans in order to do full justice to their Epicurean feasts. We, a scant sixteen or seventeen hundred years later, were accustomed to spend a good hour sitting on chairs, preferably with comfortable backs, while dinner was being served. These people stood up. But since they were endowed with a delicate albeit well-made physique, they would simply have collapsed at one of our normal social meals long before the hour was up. For that reason, everything had to move along briskly in order not to overtax the fragile limbs of these youngest, and at the same time, most aged, members of the human family. The ancient deadly sin of gluttony had already begun to die out in my day of lettuce-eating reducing fanatics. To recline while eating, then to sit, and finally to stand, those are the stages in the climactic rise of man. So we stood in a circle about the abstract work of art which appeared to serve the purpose of edifying the eyes and the soul while the body consumed food. In a moment, however, it will become apparent that my thinking was quite obsolete if I imagined that only the body consumed food, while the eyes and soul, in contrast, required an aesthetic stimulus. A definite seating arrangement, if I may use the old-fashioned word in the absence of both table and seats, was observed. It was, moreover, the traditional arrangement. The place of honor at the right of the lady of the house and mother of the bride, La Raza, was assigned to me, the exotic guest. At my right hand stood a lady of indestructible youthful beauty who was called the Ancestress, and who was treated with marked respect by the entire assembly. She was the great-grandmother of Lo Fager, the lord of the manor and father of the bride, and she was close to the limits of her life. The long span of life made it possible for five, and even six, generations to live and flourish contemporaneously. For the student of the Bible, who has in mind the tables of genealogy back to the deluge, this fact will be neither disturbing nor annoying. The reduced population and the longer span of life here, and now bore a definite relationship to each other that can easily be checked against the Old Testament. Only one person in the assembly about this non-existent table was older than the ancestress at my right. That was the spokesman, the liveliest and most eloquent man in the company. These bachelors, who actually led a parasitic existence, earned their bed and board by wit, encyclopedic information, ability as raconteurs and entertainers, and by cavalierly ceremonious courtesy. They would have reminded any historian, on the one hand, of the sycophants of Athens, on the other, of the abbés of the slightly later 18th century, all of whom were nothing more than outsiders and parasites of society. But, God knows, I was no historian nor any other kind of highbrow, and I regretted the many hundreds of recitation periods that I had skipped in order to saunter through the ancient streets of our city or to drink beer and play billiards in quaint little saloons. On my tongue burned a thousand questions that I wanted to whisper into B.H.'s ear. But he stood at the opposite side of the circle and was concealed from me by the abstract work of art. 
I regarded it as worse than inconsiderate to place a spirit summoned from the past between two charming ladies of the present instead of putting his mentor or Virgil helpfully at his side. Gradually, I became accustomed to the phenomenon of longevity. But how these human bodies remained youthful and unchanged even on the threshold of extreme old age is still a mystery to me. The breasts of the ancestress at my side were as small and firm as those of any young girl. Was this the result of a new and unknown dispensation of nature, unimagined in earlier eras, or of a rigid diet practice dot from early youth, or merely of an unspeakably cunning art of cosmetics? I must confess that this agelessness did not please me at all. On the contrary, it frightened me, it oppressed me, it seemed as uncanny as secret sin, the product of monstrous, highly cultivated wantonness, of sternly methodical egotism. That sacrificed genuine, compact life to an unending sham existence. The rosy flesh of the ancestress exhaled a wonderfully delicate fragrance. Yet I avoided looking at her. I turned and twisted in search of help, trying desperately to catch BH's eye. I did not succeed, for Loraza, the lady of the house, handed me a goblet of heavy crystal. The meal had begun. It consisted of six courses, each served in a crystal goblet of a different color and shape the interior of which was not much larger than an egg cup. It is apparent, therefore, that the meal consisted of a series of beverages, three of them very hot and three ice cold. The hot ones were pale pink, terracotta, and bouillon brown. The ice cold ones were pistachio green, saffron yellow, and creamy white. This liquid menu relieved me of the anxious embarrassment which had plagued me for some time, namely that I would have to manipulate a set of strange eating utensils but I faithfully watched the mouths of my neighbors. They took tiny, testing sips from the edges of their cups, very pensively, very dreamily, and in silence. And so I supped the proffered liquid in like manner. With a little imagination I could have deduced even before the meal that the human race had long lost its taste for solid food. The mere thought of feeding on dead flesh must have been more revolting to my new friends than the thought to me of devouring a human steak well seasoned with Worcestershire sauce. Their disgust seemed not, however, to be confined to meat alone, but also to vegetable food, to the consumption of every created variety, including even artificially produced types such as cakes, cookies, tarts, and all other bakery goods. To what extent this radical change in the history of nutrition was induced by the necessity of saving wear and tear on the teeth, I could not ascertain. I was aware, however, that the coefficient of deterioration in the highly advanced stages of nature imperiled first the hair and next the teeth. Nevertheless, the teeth that I saw glistened with enamel. So the dinner guests ate nothing but three salty soupy and two fruity clear courses, followed in conclusion by a milky thickish liquid, and all that in the smallest portions imaginable. I confess that it seemed to me at first a rather unintelligible sort of eating. No, of drinking, no of sipping or nibbling. A while ago, I used the old-fashioned and affected little word, sup, possibly to express my doubts that the proffered nutritive liquids, consumed practically a drop at a time, could actually sustain a man, even though he were only a portly ghost like me. Soon, however, I was to change my mind. All food that we eat has a twofold significance. In the first place, it provides an experience for our sense of taste, and, in the second place, it satisfies the body's demand for calories. The taste experience is concerned only with the substance of the food. The satisfaction of hunger, however, is concerned with the matter of the same food. There is undoubtedly a philosophical distinction between substance and matter, for matter is nothing but matter, while substance is matter raised to the power of an intrinsic idea. For example, water is matter, the sea is substance. Long ago, I am speaking of the time before my long-forgotten death, the matter served at our tables far exceeded the substance, that is, we had to consume a large quantity of meat in order to enjoy fully the taste experience of a roast loin of venison. This ratio had been miraculously reversed in the course of time. Here a maximum of substance was served us in a minimum of matter. And since we have already mentioned the sea, I must now say that the second course, the reddish terracotta soup, served in a heavy crystal, was the sea itself. It is true, indeed, that even back in my time, I had tasted many a morsel, swallowed many a drop of the sea, 
or of the intrinsic idea of the sea. What, after all, are a dozen widestable oysters, washed down with the right chablis, if not the substance of the sea? Or, even more properly limited, are they not the intrinsic idea of the North Sea? Or what of the claws of a Helgoland lobster with their impertinently elusive sweetness that only manifests itself completely in the aftertaste? Or the cheap Portugueses, our sins, monies, violets, that are au pound feared for sale all day long on the street corners of southern French coastal towns? These common, ordinary Portugueses, with their fragrance of seaweed and algae, are they not the personification of the Mediterranean Sea? And what of a bisque de homard at Pruners in Paris? And a bouillabaisse in a fishing village between Marseilles and Toulon? And a Grand Sevilla, a sea spider, in a Venetian tavern, served with a little vinegar and oil and pepper? It is not only the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, it is an even more limited substance, the Adriatic. And still, in those few drops of terracotta liquid I enjoyed all these things together and simultaneously and, what is more, in an imponderable and entirely indescribable manner. Each of the six courses thus became a spiritual incorporation, a perceptive insinuation of significant substances by virtue of their taste. We took a tiny sip, two or three drops. These drops dissolved on the tongue and diffused their pleasant warmth or chill, as the case might be, through the entire organism, down to the tips of the fingers and toes. Now, moreover, it became clear to me why we stood at the meal, namely to afford the pleasurable sensation an easier opportunity to communicate itself to the most remote nerve endings. Simultaneously with the physical pleasure, however, the most agreeable series of concepts and images flooded the imagination, so that presently, like all the other participants, I lingered, meditated, dreamed over every single drop of this mental meal. Back in my time, only the most musical persons had experienced a similar insinuation at, let us say, an orchestral performance of Debussy's La Mer. In the pauses between courses, probably according to custom, the spokesman, the house sage, and the permanent guest delivered lengthy harangues directed, no doubt, at me, since I could frequently distinguish the word senior, but I understood practically nothing that was said. My strange intellectual capacity to understand and even to speak the language of this period at the first attempt failed me from time to time, and then my replies were a jumble of German, French, English, Italian, and Spanish. And my forehead was wet with perspiration. At such moments B.H. became ashamed of me and peered out from behind the abstract work of art, prompting me with frantic gestures. But the others always understood me, or at least they pretended to do so probably because of their fear of the inappropriate and unpleasant. But this understanding was limited, to be sure, as we shall soon see. In the interval after the third course, merely to make conversation, I turned to Loraza, the lovely mother of the bride, at my left. The fare in your house is delectable. Frankly, I must say, I have never eaten so well in all my life. Of course, it is my first meal in my present, surprising existence, for 111 not even speak of my former life. You have an excellent cuisine, madam. B.H.'s head darted out desperately from behind its cover. I had committed a second unpardonable faux pas. How could one speak of food in this most aesthetic of all worlds as though one were lounging around in a beer joint reeking of warmed-up goulash? I was frightfully startled, but the lady gave no sign of resentment. A charming smile ran over her lovely features softened by the diffused light, as in the most amiable manner she discharged her social duty of instructing me, the greenhorn, with gentle unobtrusiveness. We have no cuisine of our own, senior. The recipes that have been in the possession of our family for hundreds of years, and that cannot be transferred to any other family without a notarial seal, are centrally prepared. Aha! There it was again! that intriguing word centrally, I thought, and raised my voice to ask, is it perhaps the worker, madam, who at the same time acts as caterer? What do you know about the worker, senior? asked Loraza with some astonishment. You are very well informed. Not sufficiently, madam, not sufficiently by far, I rejoined. But I suspect something very great, and I know that he is the only one to wear a full beard. That's not all, she said and it asterisk guess not quite exact either. 
There are a few other persons who wear the full beard. All conversation about us ceased. Even without B.H. slash S. Reproving glance, I should have known that it was not good taste to direct several questions in succession to a lady. But my curiosity and the interest that the concept of the worker aroused in me were too strong. Is the worker only a man, or is he also an object? I asked, and I was ashamed of the question that reminded me of some silly parlor game. But before Loraza, the mother of the bride, could answer my unseemly question, we were interrupted by a little incident that attracted the attention of the company. A dog ran into the room. It was a real honest-to-goodness dog, a dog with four paws, ten hide, big, hairy, hanging ears, and a longish muzzle. Slim, medium-sized, and extraordinarily vivacious as he was, I could not determine his breed. But he seemed to be a more concentrated epitome of dogdom than all the dogs of my time that had so often been the products of exaggerated inbreeding. I have used the word dog, but what had become of the dog in a hundred thousand years of ever more intimate contact with man and human care? His physical form, hide, muzzle, ears, paws, had remained entirely doggish. But through the mournful and beast bound foundation of this doggishness, there leered, whined, sniffed, fond, a sort of human likeness, or rather of humanishness. It was obvious in every approaching or receding bound, in the hesitation or decision of his motions, but most of all in his attentive, his calculating, his greedily appraising look. I could scarcely believe my eyes. I believed my ears even less when the dog began to speak. It was a barking, but a hundred times more modulated than the barking I knew. And out of it there developed quite naturally a vocabulary that may have been limited but was adequate for the expression of the dog's thought processes. Why, the dog is speaking, I blurted. Everybody looked at me in surprise. So far I had felt equal to my adventure, in spite of my stiff-bosomed shirt and white tie. Now my fine-featured friends seemed to think, what's gotten into him? The dog is speaking. Didn't dogs always speak? Can there have been a time when they didn't speak? Oh, you idiot, I said to myself, of course dogs have always spoken. The fact that they now speak a refined language lies in the law of evolution and isn't astonishing at all. When will my nerves finally become calm enough so that I won't constantly lay myself wide open? Meanwhile, the animal jumped up alternately on Lofager and Loraza. With exuberant dog stammering, he fawned on his master and mistress babbling his words with the crafty and venal ingenuousness of a child motion picture star. It was really funny. This morally corrupt animal spoke in an affected jargon. He barked in a sort of long, drawn-out, bantering accent. Howdy, mammy, howdy, pappy, so there you are. Where have you been? How's about something for sir? Today's the first wedding dinner, so there must be something for sir. Some of the green stuff, please. The pistachio green stuff. L-O-L-A sent sir upstairs. Who all is here? How's about letting sir chase the ball around the fountain? Pretty please. What a life. What a life. You know sir has to have his run. Ha ha. H-M-H-M. Suddenly the dog sensed that things weren't exactly as they should be. He interrupted his baby talk and his pretentious barking. He was a good, round 52 years old, they told me. He began to quiver from head to foot laid his ears back, pinched his tail between his legs, and, looking at me in horror, he uttered a long, singing whine. Well, I thought, at last you were noticing something. Your good old ancestors were less finished actors and speakers than you, but their primitive instinct would have spotted a ghost at once, a mile away at least, no matter whether it appeared in a boiled shirt or in the negligee of a grave shroud. In whining tones the dog panted, Mammy, Pappy, What's all this? What are you doing to Sir again? That fellow isn't as supposed to exist at all. That fellow doesn't exist. He doesn't belong here with us. Let me out. In spite of his articulate words, genuine animal terror now engulfed a shrewd humanishness. But I, dismayed at my situation and disgusted with the toadying manner as well as with the cowardice of the dog, grumbled to myself, nobody needs to be scared of me, and besides I'm not really dead at all. I'm breathing and eating, as you can see, my dear dog. The master of the house, Lo Fager, even more embarrassed than I, made a quick end to the interlude. Get out of here, sir. 
don't want in our guest. Out into the garden, you fool, and be sure to get back on time. Sir vanished without another word. No matter how human his conduct, his name was only Sir. The prepositive low, which means I, and thus implies immortality, was not accorded to him in spite of progress and pampering. Pray, forgive Sir's bad manners, Lofager turned to me. After all, there are limits to the educability of dogs, even of intellectually and morally superior specimens. But certain ones of our Democrats will not admit that. They are bitter because there are differences between the rights of men and of dogs. I need mention only the famous publication entitled, The Accident of Being Born a Dog and the Obligation of Human Society to Make Amends to the Creature So Afflicted. That is certainly going too far. I managed to begin. And then a social accident happened to me that brought me, and as a result also B.H., into the most embarrassing situation. I was on the point of confessing to the master of the house in unvarnished terms my definite impression and honest opinion regarding the dog, sir. Your dog, my dear sir, is a thoroughly disreputable character. But suddenly I was no longer capable of speaking the language of this age in which I was unexpectedly a visitor. While only a brief moment earlier I had been conversing with these charming ladies and gentlemen of advanced age in their own idiom as unselfconsciously as though it had been my mother tongue, now I suddenly could not force a single syllable of this idiom through my lips nor could I comprehend a syllable of it. It was a horrifying feeling of impotence, of which I still retain a physical memory. My heart beat in my throat, and I thought I would suffocate. Vatri Chien, I stammered in French, Asterisk, a untraced movise character. The man looked at me, nonplussed and uncomprehending. No one replied. I tried it in Italian. Questo cana un molto brutto character. The general embarrassment grew. Mechanically, I muttered the sentence in a few other languages that I had picked up in the course of my long exile. It must have sounded like a Berlitz school. Dieser Hund had einen gan schlechten character. Ten pies ma barzo marni character. I was aware that Lo Raza and Lo Fager were trying to help me over the situation with cheerful words. It sounded like Aztecan or Zapotecan, Tilbicha, Tapotla clan, Potal Tukwel Queen Mississipono. Well, now I was in a fix. It was nothing but saccharine twittering. If you look at a language merely from the outside, as at the front of a house, you have no idea of the inhabitants. Nor is there any difference in the matter of language between astronomical advancement or primordial primitivity. For heaven's sake, help me, B.H. I groaned. The face of my friend, who now emerged almost menacingly from behind the piece of sculpture, was very pale. He pressed his hand against his temple as though to emphasize the headache that I, his disgrace personified, had caused him through my conduct. Calm down, F.W. Asterisk, he whispered sharply, and use a little psychology, if you please. In the monolingual language of this age, offensive things that one importunately regards as truthful and candid cannot be publicly uttered. Then it seemed as if my ears and throat suddenly opened again. Unexpectedly and unselfconsciously, I again became master of the current language, and with a polite bow I turned to the master of the house, Lofager. Your dog is very handsome and very intelligent, I said. It came out smooth as oil, and he did not occasion me the slightest pang of remorse, nor did I feel the least need of expressing what I really thought. Moreover, I recognized with an inspired flash that in this day and age it was not at all necessary to express one's thoughts, since up to a certain point everyone knew them anyhow. To my word of praise I added the following question, What breed is your dog, sir? I couldn't quite make it out. A new wave of astonishment went around. The permanent guest asked uncertainly, What do you mean by what breed? Senor? Isn't a dog a dog? There is only one kind of dog. At this very point in the conversation, I began to distinguish the individual faces. Out of the pale background of general beauty and youthfulness there emerged, visible to my eye for the first time, characteristic traits and distinctions. The permanent guest, for example, had a long nose and deeper hollows in his cheeks than the others. Furthermore, his forehead almost disappeared under the silver headdress of iridescent material. He reminded me of the bust of a Baroque prince of the Habsburg or Bourbon line with a powdered wig. I became so engrossed in my study of the faces that I forgot to answer. 
BH therefore threw in a remark in order to keep the conversation from lagging and in order to help me out. My friend FW, he said, was familiar with several breeds and varieties of dogs in his day, and with that he gave me an encouraging wink, inviting me to dilate entertainingly upon this harmless topic that could hardly get anyone into trouble. But since I felt that I was being made unpleasantly conspicuous by BH's encouragement, I remained silent and devoted myself to a further differentiating contemplation of the faces. Then the house sage insinuated himself into the conversation. His face was somewhat plumper than the others, with a trace of a double chin. He impressed me as a vain and somewhat effeminate individual who was dominated by the spokesman and as a superfluous figure of secondary importance in the households. In the folkloristic section of our cephrodrome, he began rapidly, as though apprehensive that he might not be permitted to finish his sentence without interruption. There are several dissertations that deal with a myth concerning five or six different varieties of dogs, each of which is said to have served a different purpose, one for the killing of animals, another for the guiding of the blind, a third for the guarding of little children, a fourth for the pursuit of criminals, and a fifth for the performance of certain magic rites connected with the goddess Hecate. He was quite right to be apprehensive about his sentence, for the spokesman cut him off with a curt gesture. But now I intervened. It would be a mistake to regard the subject of these dissertations in the cephrodrome as a myth. You see, I have the audacity to use the word cephrodrome without even knowing what it means. No, that story about the breeds of dogs is by no means a myth but historical reality. And I began to enumerate greyhounds and street burners and chows and little Pekingese and wolfhounds and mastiffs and dobermans and terriers dash. B.H. indicated by a gesture that it was enough. But now the spokesman bowed in my direction. To you, senior, he said, who were reared in a colorful, magic world teeming with a variety of creatures, our modern world must seem woefully impoverished. Not impoverished, I replied with equal politeness, for I knew by this time that every word one spoke had to be agreeable. Not impoverished, merely simplified. Does not life's ascent progress from the egoless? crawling throng to the unique personality, from the infinitely repetitive stereotype to the rarity, from ant-like socialism to serene isolation? In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, your world seems to have risen far above ours, even though it may have lost its colorfulness and variety under your glaring and eternally cloudless skies. Is it not characteristic of all creative activity to produce at the outset an unbridled abundance? and at its zenith to practice critical selectivity and to incline toward genteel simplicity and almost holy sterility? In my day, we called that progression toward the classical and monumental. B.H. as I caught me up short. My philosophy of culture seemed to have overstepped the bounds again. The words holy sterility stood out like an ink blot on a nice, clean birthday letter. My friend has always inclined toward generalities, said B.H. with a conciliatory smile in all directions. That has been his failing as long as I've known him. The master of the household, Lo Fager, however, lowered his head. My ability to distinguish faces had now developed to the extent that I was quite aware that this man was not only the most eminent, but also the most consequential in the company. His face seemed to me paler and more masculine than those of the others. The smoothness of the skin and the absence of all signs of shaving on the men's faces had at first impressed me unfavorably. In his deep voice, Lofaja commented on my words. I understand Sanyar very well. He is quite right to praise our attainments. We could be well content with the conditions under our glaring and eternally cloudless skies, if only nature could be persuaded to grant these conditions a conservative permanence. But nature always has secret designs. And as far as man is concerned, our best families are not all equal to their task. Our lazy domestic life, our inactive, contemplative calm, our freedom from all compulsion, our cheerful, idle play, all these gifts that God has given us after the toil and trouble of well-nigh endless dark ages, and that we may enjoy without pangs of conscience. All these things are no longer regarded as pleasures by our children. And, turning with a deep bow to the ancestress whose archaically stylized silver tresses curled about her flawless neck, he concluded, your generation, great-grandmother, reached the absolute pinnacle, for it knew no doubts. The ancestress smiled, 
her white teeth flashing and her eyes bright though they lay deep in their sockets. I don't know why I suddenly experienced a slight shock at the sight of this beautiful face. I may have suspected the unbounded cynicism which the words of the ancestress revealed or perhaps concealed. Yes, what we've had, we've had. My recent words seemed to have distressed the lord of the manor. It was up to me to correct my mistake. Little as I have seen of your world with my own eyes, I began. Still, I have a very fair idea of the tremendous strides you have made in the direction of a well-regulated existence. You have succeeded in trebling the span of human life and, what asterisk is infinitely more important, you have succeeded in eliminating the ugly deterioration of old age. You have, as far as I can see, realized a dream that is as old as mankind itself. The fountain of youth of the oldest myths and legends has become a reality. All of you, like the gods of Greece, are eternally young and eternally beautiful. I mention these gods particularly because it gives me a homely feeling to hear you mingle Greek words with your speech. But perhaps you don't know anything about the origin of these words. Moreover, you have solved the one problem that seemed the most hopeless in my day. Work is no longer a curse borne by a world of slaves for the advantage of a few profiteering politicians. And along with this curse, you have also abolished the curse of technology that robs slaves and profiteers alike of their souls by inundating them with mass products, mass pleasures, mass art, mass utility, and mass murder. Everything in your world runs so incredibly smoothly. A delectable banquet, consisting of the most concentrated substances, the adder of roses of nutritive enjoyment, so to speak, is prepared centrally but on the basis of highly personalized recipes handed down by centuries of patrician generations. You travel by the mental manner, moving your destination toward you by means of a toy, a procedure that does not involve the slightest cost and consumes no steam, no oil, no electricity, or any other sort of power. You have unified the globe. There are no more races and nations, but only a single human family. There are no more languages either, but only a single language, the monolingua, which is no artificial Esperanto but an organic, euphonious speech, and I must ask your indulgence for the harsh accent with which my primitive tongue is afflicted. Furthermore, there is no longer any distinction between city and country, the distinction between the scenically beautiful wilderness where the untutored peasant or mountaineer eked out a frugal existence in the overcrowded city. The wicked and infectious megalopos where the proletarianized millions had neither space nor time. Fulfilling the social destiny of mankind, you have transformed the earth into a universal city, a panopolis, carrot for given old humanist for a classical pun, pan and panis, universal city and bread city. The necessities of life are delivered to your houses in the lightest, the most refined, the most enjoyable form, and all that without any pipes or hydraulic installations, the mere thought of which would spoil one's appetite. I confess that in my day and age I never dreamed that all this could ever be attained. The meal seemed to be at an end. I had sipped the sweet, ice-cold, creamy decoction too fast, and I was beginning to feel a little high in a curious manner that accentuated my ego and made me talk too much and without any timidity. I presume I didn't make too good an impression. Throughout my speech, Lo Fager kept his head lowered. I noted casually that his headdress was still of gold. He did not seem to agree with me. For that reason, perhaps, the spokesman now tried to change the subject. Senior, he said, you have just paid some very agreeable compliments to our present day and the satisfaction of a kind and intelligent guest always pleases the hosts. We do not wish to tax the strength of our kind and intelligent guest too greatly, especially since he has come from far away to remain with us, we trust, for a good long time. But perhaps, Senior, you would favor us with a little cosery, a few well-chosen remarks, a few reminiscences of the life you left some eras ago, of the things that seem to you memorably different from our present life. Oh, but that would lead too far afield. Monsieur, I replied apprehensively. You need not speak in generalities in your few well-chosen remarks, Senior. The spokesman encouraged me. Just speak in personal, purely personal terms, asterisk. The words personal, purely personal rang hypnotically in my ears. I vaguely felt a reclining chair with hard upholstery being pushed under me. 
and I dropped into it with relaxed muscles. The gentlemen and ladies formed an intimate circle about me. With astonishment, I saw the vague outlines of the iridescent headdresses of gold and silver, the chastely blurred flesh color of the naked bodies under the diaphanous veils. My eyes sought out BH. He smiled and seemed to be quite satisfied with me. Then I closed my eyes. At once the present time of a strange world of the future vanished and gave way to the past of a homely world of the present, a world which had, so to speak, stopped like a clock at the moment of my death. About the former, the present world of the future, I had just managed to wax flatteringly eloquent, to make a few well-chosen remarks, a little cosery, as the spokesman called it, about the latter, the past world of the present, was far more difficult. I probably disappointed the cool, volatile spirit of the spokesman who knew how to wrap up every problem in a few well-chosen remarks, since speaking was his household chore. I did not succeed in producing any striking aphorisms or noteworthy adages, but only vague circumlocutions, parables, and examples. After all, I was only a primitive man. I am now imagining, Messrs. Dames, I began without opening my eyes, that I am just twelve years old. It is the middle of July, the school year is over, last Saturday the report cards were distributed, and we have gone out to the country, the whole family, parents and children. Ten weeks of vacation lie before me, an eternity of laziness, of curiosity, of physical pleasure and spiritual happiness, swimming in the lake, sailing, wild games with other boys, croquet tournaments, drives, outings, mountain climbing, picnics, unusual meals and quaint inns, garden parties, fireworks, rest on broad mountain meadows, Sleep in forest clearings fragrant with cyclamen and spicy with the pine needles of countless dead autumns. Oh, how many adventures I feel await me. Adventures. It is still the 15th of July. Ladies and gentlemen, why does the 12 year old, staring out of a dormer window at the eternal, shadowy mountains, suddenly realize that one day it will not be the 15th of July, but the 15th of September, and that all the adventures of happiness and freedom that now lie before him will then lie behind? And how is it that at the very instant this thought came to him it had really happened, and the 15th of September was actually there? Do you understand me? Do you understand me? I did not know whether they understood me. No answer broke the darkness before my eyes. I tried to explain by means of another example. Back in our world, we had a wonderful institution called Opera. You've probably never heard anything about it. Opera. Please help me out, B.H. Sempayan, B.H. translated. Sempayan, a few voices repeated in chorus, indicating that the matter was not entirely strange. Sempayan or Opera, it makes no difference, asterisk, I heard myself say from behind black veils. I was more than an enthusiast. I was a fanatic about the opera. The tenor has finished his aria. In a moment the expansive melody of Amneris will follow, Quaili insolita Givia, and then the breathless tours Tarcano Amore Scopri Che Amarde in Cor. And finally, balanced on the swaying and shifting prop of a syncopated soft flourish of a single French horn and a little, piano pianissimo roll of the keldrum, there blooms forth the intoxicating, the deliriant trio, crowned by the sadly proud, vaulting notes of the soprano, asterisk ah, no, su ue mia patria non gmi el cor, all that I know, measure by measure, all that I await, I look forward to it with longing, all that I want to die can once more and perpetuate in my soul, but at the moment when the melody is about to unfold, the anguishing thought takes hold of me that in an instant it will be over and gone, and in my heart it is already gone, even before the accompaniment of the orchestra has begun. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Continued silence. I still did not open my eyes. My time, Messrs. Dames, was very short, measured by yours. It resembled in some respects the traditional melodies of our ancestors, whose beginnings enclosed their ends and whose endings enclosed their beginnings. While their notes still vibrated, they had already expired for we carried them as sweet memories in our hearts. Oh, terra adio, adio valle di piante. Time burned from both ends toward the middle, and the middle was my exposed and unprotected ego. At thirty years I looked forward to the fortieth, at forty to the fiftieth year, I, the most thoughtless, 
the most unprincipled sinner of my acquaintance. I always thought back or ahead. My watch never showed the present. And when it was all over, it had scarcely begun. And yet it had been going on forever. Do you understand me? I opened my eyes. The lovely ancestress was approaching me. I tried to jump up. With her alabaster hand that looked cold as ice, she motioned me to remain seated. I understand. Senior, she said in her cynically vibrant contralto voice, I understand that you clung passionately to life back in the beginnings of mankind. And I, for my person, replied truthfully, I often clung passionately to life, madam, and as often passionately wished myself out of it. I assume that even today you know what it means to waken in the dawn to the sudden realization of the loss of a loved one, of a mother, a child, to waken as a condemned prisoner, to waken in a trench at four o'clock in the morning before the attack. We were always imperiled, always menaced by the loss and by the final fate of our own ego and of those nearest to us. The final fate was a euphemism. I had already reached the point where I could not possibly have used the bare word, death. Then the permanent guest, he of the characteristic Baroque head, spoke. Well, things have certainly changed in our time, for we set out on our final journey voluntarily and on foot. I stood up and bowed. Not I, sir, but you have given the explanation. You are right. The difference lies wholly in the spontaneity and predetermination of the final eliminating crisis. Our nerves were terrorized day and night by the expectation of the unexpected. Every breath of our life was imperiled. Meanwhile, mankind has performed its greatest act. You have tamed time, Messrs. Dames. You are imperiled neither from without nor from within. We are imperiled, said Low Fager after a significant pause. Understanding glances passed from one to the other. The ivory tint of their faces seemed to have become a shade bluer. We are imperiled. Senior, the father of the bride continued, more cruelly and more horribly than you ever were. Do not overestimate the contrast between the generations I sought to calm him, mindful of the words he had spoken a while ago about the young people of the period. At times the natural antagonism of children toward their parents becomes more acute. That is not a serious menace, but a form of natural development. Back in my day, we had a philosopher by the name of Hegel, whose works were very hard to read. Nevertheless, his theory of historical dialectics became a commonplace. A thesis produces an antithesis. The pendulum must swing from one extreme to the other, just to keep things moving. It is not a matter of antagonism between children and parents at all, rejoined Lofager, shaking his golden head. Could it be that you were threatened by a calamity of nature? I insisted, prompted by inordinate curiosity. Surely you possess the means to protect yourselves against glaciation or inundation. Certainly we possess those means, nodded the house sage, asterisk, but the calamity that we fear is of an entirely different character. I tried to catch B.H.'s eye. He avoided me. Doesn't he know anything about it? Asked the master of the household. No, not yet, replied B.H. The meal was ended. The circle about the abstract but disturbingly expressive work of art had broken up in obedience to a smile and a slight nod of the hostess, La Raza. The fine-featured and well-formed men and women divided into two distinctly separate groups. It reminded me of the English custom, and I had the casual notion that many tens of thousands of years ago the world must have been unified and dominated by the Anglo-Saxons and that this puritanical after-dinner habit had been preserved from that time to the most remote future. Moreover, it occurred to me that it was a prudish and almost hypocritical custom that had lost its cogent meaning in view of the absent, or at least restrained, emotions of the sexes. Doors opened noiselessly and revealed three or four adjoining rooms each of which was suffused with warm, variously colored light. This polychromatic illumination actually seemed to have replaced the dressmaker's art in the new world. For, as the handsome figures of my new associates moved gracefully from one chamber to another, they appeared to be clothed in costumes of new designs and colors, depending upon the source of light. At this point, I must inject a personal comment into my account. My astigmatic eyes had condemned me to wear glasses during my whole life. After my decease, however, these seemed to have been taken from me. 
As a result, my features perhaps looked a bit more attractive, but I was constantly embarrassed, and my task was made much more difficult since I saw everything only in blurred contours and sometimes only in vague outlines. There is a simple moral to be drawn from this circumstance. Don't take the spectacles from the noses of your dear departed, for you never can tell. In this respect, the Egyptians and other ancient peoples were much more prudent. They equipped their dead with a complete and well-selected outfit which put to shame even that of a wealthy bride. I would have been satisfied with a spare shirt, two collars, two handkerchiefs, and, most of all, my glasses, just as there had been no visible leftovers from the meal. So I was also unaware of any digestive after-effects. I felt neither satiation nor unappeased appetite, nothing but a slight, cheerful warmth. Of course, I hadn't stuffed myself full of matter as I used to do in my good days, though stuffing had its points, too. I had only consumed substance, or perhaps only the idea of substance, from a tiny hollow of heavy crystal. I must direct the reader's attention to the fact, carrot which probably did not escape him anyhow, that neither the preparation nor the serving of this meal required any domestic help, nor did I see any. Each little goblet of soup or beverage was passed to me by the hand of Loraza in person. How it got there, and how the remaining goblets got into the hands of the other guests, is more than I can say. Blame it on my deplorable astigmatism. It occurred to me more than once that the next time a deceased person is sent out to make a report of this kind, an individual without any physical defects should be selected. The thing that surprised me most was the fact that I did not feel the slightest craving for tobacco or alcohol. I neither groped in my pocket for a package of cigarettes nor did I look around for a glass of cognac. Could a hundred thousand years of abstinence have sufficed to wean me from these vices? But even if the weaning period had been too short, my ingrained craving could not have been satisfied. For the people in the New World, I was visiting neither smoked nor drank. Along with all passions mankind seemed to have conquered its desire for stimulating poisons, the residue of Dionysiac self-destruction of which we were so foolishly proud in our youth that we vied in nightly excesses. How I used to despise the virtuous youths who couldn't stand much drink and who crawled into bed at eleven o'clock. And how I admired the heroic figures who staggered from nightclub to nightclub until early dawn with ruddy faces and bleary eyes. Incidentally, we were not the only ones who revered the drinker and drinking. Our near-contemporary Plato, only some two thousand years before us, endowed his intellectual hero Socrates at the age of seventy with the ability to drink all comers under the table and still sneak out into the dawn with a fair show of sobriety. Well, Plato and we were wrong, and these people here were right. Their eternal youth proved it. Or were they really right? At the first opportunity, one made my way to B.H. and, in whispers, demanded information. You see, asterisk I grumbled. Everybody is surprised that I don't know anything about the most important things. They simply can't understand why you leave me in ignorance. Don't be so reserved or so jealous. He looked furtively around and then led me into one of the smallest of the adjoining rooms, where we could expect to be undisturbed. But before we reached this surprisingly dark little chamber, I was addressed and drawn into polite conversation by several of the gentlemen. It was the emptiest conversation imaginable. I suppose a materialized spirit can't expect any other treatment. At the same time, I must confess that everyone ignored my unusual circumstances in the most tactful manner. And no one gave any indication either by word or sign that I didn't belong here but had merely been summoned from the fantastic diversity of the primitive wilderness to the great simplicity of genuine culture. With unalloyed courtesy they put me at my ease and kept me from feeling too inferior. Finally B.H. and I sat in the amber darkness of the little room that seemed expressly intended for private conversations. I, in my old dress coat, and he, in the copied uniform of a lieutenant in the First World War, formed an island, a fossil remain of the twentieth century, in an immeasurably advanced period. That is almost more than a metaphor, for the two of us from the most remote past were lodged in the amber of the present like two extinct insects. A deep calm was about us, for in this day and age no one ever raised his voice, no rough guttural, no cackling laughter, no shrill confusion, disturbed the peace. 
Even the most animated conversation of a large company seemed to take place behind vocal veils. Why, incidentally, my reincarnated friend wore wrapped puttees and an old military blouse was something that I forgot to ask, although I repeatedly made up my mind to do so. I must confess I felt indescribably relaxed, even exhausted, as I sat there alone with my old friend B.H. No one who has not experienced it, and who but I have, can conceive the strain on body and soul of a sojourn in an era as remote and alien as this. Well, now, what is this thing that I don't know, and that you are keeping from me? I asked, and at the same time suppressed a spasmodic yawn of exhaustion. The jungle, B.H. replied laconically and obscurely. The jungle? What do you mean by dash? Probably something different than you would mean. Asterisk he interrupted me, and an expression of utter loathing came over his features. I mean swinish hubbub. I mean deafening noise of merry-go-rounds and calliopes. And besides that they keep roosters and clucking hens. Why in the devil shouldn't they keep roosters and clucking hens? Well, I suppose I'll have to translate it for you. What would you have thought, back in your day, of a farm where they raised vultures or murderous condors as domestic animals? After a little more fencing, I finally learned the following. Up to a few generations ago, the entire planet, with the exception of some dead or uninhabitable spots and of the oceans that had shrunk considerably in size, had been subject to the prevailing morality. Moreover, it had been completely covered with the gray, elastic carpet of sod that I had noticed on my arrival in this era. For some time, however, this picture had undergone changes. Chiefly, at the outskirts of civilization, something had broken out that was described to me in obscure terms filled with loathing, such as jungle or swinish hubbub. At first, I couldn't get a clear idea of what was meant, but presently I understood that this mysterious affair was not only a matter of vegetative abnormally, but that it also involved a human aberration. The vegetative irregularity appeared, however, to have been the cause and incentive for the later unfortunate developments. In a manner that human science could neither explain nor prevent, swamps had formed at various places on the Earth's surface, and these had soon changed into a blossoming wilderness, into emerald green oases, with mountain-like elevations, fragrant valleys, lakes, brooks, rivers, and tall trees. In spite of themselves, the eyes of observers were attracted to these dangerous islands which loomed blue on the horizon. And what next? I asked in surprise, when everything was clear up to this point. You act as if these charming variations in your dull prairies were as loathsome as smallpox and leprosy. They are smallpox and leprosy, B.H. reproved me. Don't you know that the very worst thing in this world is backsliding, and that the jungle is a temptation to backslide? In abrupt, hasty words I learned that these islands were constantly on the increase, and that one of these jungles existed even here in the vicinity of California, that abominable flora and fauna had come into being, or rather, had come back into being, there. And finally, horrible to contemplate, that a new race of men had sprung up, conceived and born of deserters and delinquents who had been unable to resist the temptation to backslide. Ape-like creatures had developed there, dwarfs or giants, varying from the noble norm that mankind had attained, savages that littered their young like cats and carried them about as long, in short, a swinish hubble. LT ought to be a simple matter for your government to clean up these Rousseauist retreats from culture. I shrugged. Don't you have the necessary death rays to erase these jungles in a jiffy, along with the roosters and clucking hens? He made a horrified gesture and stared at me with a pale face. What are you saying? Don't you know that we are incapable of, of eliminating any living creature? At the last moment, he had succeeded in avoiding the word killing. At this point, we were interrupted. The spokesman, the entertaining and considerate abbe of the household, stood in the doorway of the little parlor and his silver headdress trembled a little as he apologetically invited us into the drawing room. There La Raza, the lovely mother of the bride, advanced toward us. I was annoyed because, in the first place, I should have liked to stay in our amber shelter a little longer and, in the second place, my curiosity had been sufficiently aroused so that I wanted to know more at once. Next to the worker, the jungle worried me most. I hoped that my sojourn in this world would be long enough so that I could at least get a look at this jungle, where man, with the kind assistance of nature, 
had once again managed to cast off the burden of his good manners. Since I had never been particularly attracted to well-bred people, I anticipated that the jungle would not inspire me with sufficient loathing. The charming mother of the bride dispelled my absent-mindedness with a smile. Our children, she whispered, are very anxious to speak with you. Senior, after all, the children are the most important people on these wedding days, and your gracious appearance, for which we can't thank you enough, is intended as a gift for Lodu and LOLA. The lady pointed to a small and obviously timid man in a silver headdress. He was Lo Salop, the father of the bridegroom. B.H. and I followed the slender and timid Lo Salop, who walked ahead of us with a protective gesture as though he wanted to guard me against slipping on the unfamiliar terrain. Later, I learned that the Grand Bishop had just announced his impending visit. Since the families concerned were very prominent, the prelate himself was to officiate at the wedding two days later. The lady of the house had cleverly removed me from the reception rooms. For the church, now as in the past and at all times, rejected every form of occult activity as a desecration of true mystic endeavor and as illicit tampering with the forbidden. Since this activity, however, had recently spread alarmingly over the entire globe and had, moreover, become so highly developed as to produce amazing results, as, for example, myself, the church, according to its age-old custom, winked at the practice without receding an inch from its position. It would, however, have been asking too much of a grand bishop to expect him to exchange social amenities with an occult phenomenon, with a poor soul in a boiled shirt and white tie, who should have been elsewhere carrot presumably in purgatory, and who probably had only a short leave of absence from there. The Sixth Chapter Wherein I am received by the bridegroom, am interrogated concerning the life of antique warriors and soldiers, and am shown the monument of the last war of the planet. As we followed the gentle and attentive father of the bridegroom, cherubic little Losalop, through a high, vaulted corridor bathed in the dim glow of the invisible moon, I distinctly heard the unmistakable ivory click and the rolling of billiard balls. What is that? What is that? I asked, standing still. What does it sound like? B.H. reproved me as he impatiently tugged at my sleeve. Really and truly, in the anteroom adjoining the bridegroom's bedchamber stood a billiard table on four solid, short, thick shanks, and covered with green felt, just like in the good old days. I don't know why I was so deeply moved at the sight of this object, which even back in the time of my youth had always impressed me as something archaic, something inherited from our ancestors. Ever so many valuable instruments of our civilization had vanished between the time of my last and first breath. I saw, for example, not a single piano or any other musical instrument, not even a mechanical one, no gramophone, no radio. The billiard table alone, after a tiresome infancy in dingy pool rooms, chilly country houses, and damp resort hotels, had developed an almost phenomenal longevity. Here it stood, and it seemed to me that B.H. and I must be personally acquainted with it. But I didn't dare open my mouth. The bridegroom, Lodu, appeared to have retired from the billiard table to his bedroom when he heard our approaching steps. For it was inappropriate for a young man in the days before his wedding to interrupt the period of contemplation and preparation by banal activities or games. The illumination of the room was again different from that in the reception rooms and the agreeable twilight in the corridor. The more personal and the more intimate the purpose of a room, the deeper it lay buried in the bowels of the earth, quite the reverse of the custom of a period that located its bedrooms on the upper floors. The more private these people wished to be, the farther they withdrew. In my days, some psychiatrists and hyperingenious artists had dreamed of using various mixtures or color harmonies of artificial light in conjunction with musical sounds to affect the sensibilities of an overrefined or neurotic audience. Here, these snobbish dreams had become sensible reality. Again, because of their dread of the sun, my new contemporaries lived only by artificial light in their houses. Their estrangement from nature was complete. At the same time, however, I must repeat, it was necessary. The shrinking of the oceans and the resulting reduction of cloud formation was, as we know, responsible for an eternally vacant blue sky. 
The arid atmosphere offered scarcely any resistance to the ultraviolet rays of the sun. An entire day spent outdoors would have overtaxed the strength of a Goliath. What could be more agreeable, therefore, than a house in the bowels of the earth? It was more splendid, more important, more welcome than four sheltering walls during a snowstorm in the old days. And equally satisfying and splendid and welcome was the artificial light, manipulated with the greatest ingenuity by human imagination. It reflected all nuances that nature seemed to ha happy face he forgotten long ago, from the wind-whipped pallor of a March morning to the druidic moonlight of a silvery June night, from the lilac snow-whiteness of an undulating ski course to the gold-saturated deep green of the forest, and the constantly renewed air, which I have so far forgotten to mention, was equally good, air as thin as that of mountain peaks and as loaded with iodine and salt as that of the stormy sea. It was an ideal sort of domestic existence. Like a chambered nautilus, the house protectively sealed off its dwellers against the cosmos. At the same time, it magically reproduced all moods of the cosmos in its narrow interior. Father Losalop had opened the door. We followed him into his son's apartment. Lodu, the bridegroom, reclined properly on a low, square contraption which we might have described as a couch back in my time. He wore no wig, as I have wrongly designated the headdresses of my new contemporaries, but a sort of golden helmet. Furthermore, he was not naked, but enveloped in opaque, black, veil heek material. Black was the festive color for men, just as it had been in our day. B.H. looked at me. Without a doubt, he was trying to gauge the impression that this handsome young man was making on me. In the few hours I had now spent in this new world, I had not only learned to differentiate between human faces, but I had also developed a very sharp instinct for the interpretation of features. I could have given B.H. a concise answer in a few words. A spoiled son of the wealthy class. Of course, the word wealthy would have been nonsense. Where everyone had everything, no one was wealthy. Some time later, I learned the first principle of legal philosophy concerning property rights. It established complete parity between the concept of the body as loan property and the dwelling to which every human couple was definitely entitled. But actual practice went even farther than legal theory. It provided that dwelling should, if possible, be handed down from one generation of a family to the next, just as physical characteristics of parents are transmitted to children. Whenever a wedding took place, the young couple took over the house of the bride's parents on the following day. For the latter, another house was generally made ready some time previously. With five or six generations living simultaneously, one of the many houses belonging to the clan in either the male or female line had ordinarily been vacated in the meantime. There were usually more vacant houses than young couples who were unable to marry because the parents of the bride had no house into which they could move. Moreover, the local communities took care to maintain a proper ratio between population and available houses by appropriate planning and construction. Of course, this was a matter of simple arithmetic, since people showed almost no inclination to move about and to change their place of residence. And why should they, when it was possible to travel from one end of the world to the other by merely jiggling a few colored globules into the proper lit to holes of a toy? And besides, there was no incentive to travel, since one end of the world was exactly like the other. Everywhere the same prairie, the same iron-gray carpet of sod, the same groves of trees in whose black, leathery foliage wax-like or candy-like blossoms gleamed. Reminiscent of oversized, diseased magnolias. The multifariousness of life carrot with the exception, of course, of the jungle and the swinish hubbub lay below rather than above ground in the deep and spacious caverns that were called houses without being houses in our sense, but which preserved the character expressed by the ancient writer Ibsen as homesteads for humans. For this reason, it was one of the greatest pleasures of the new occupants to transform the residents completely according to their own taste, to rearrange the interior from top to bottom as soon as the former owners had left the threshold, along with their staff of spokesmen, house sage, and permanent guest. By means of osmosis and penetration, I had learned a great deal by this time. I felt much less dependent upon my Virgil. From moment to moment, I became more convinced that the life of this day represented the realization of the dreams of communism, 
but on a strictly aristocratic basis. At the same time, it was apparent that the fulfillment of this dream had not taken place recently, but presumably countless generations ago. It occurred to me that my communistic friends back in the beginnings of mankind would hardly have approved of this sort of communistic world, a world without red flags, without marching masses, without perspiring gymnasts, without horse, croaking demagogues, without myopic atheists, pan-economists, materialists, positivists, pragmatists, worshippers of technology and science, a world without tail-wagging intellectuals, who were even more stupid than they pretend to be, and who, out of genuine envy and by order of the moguls, pretend to be even more stupid than they really are. This, on the contrary, was a world of the most aristocratic individualism, for every family lived, so to speak, in its own castle, a touch-me-not world, a world of strict privacy, of good breeding, and good living. A world that was tactful and natural even in intercourse with prehistoric ghosts, as I could testify. And yet my impression of fiancé, Lodu remained the same, a spoiled son of the wealthy class. He had the same delicately formed body as all his contemporaries and still he seemed somehow bloated. The comers of his mouth were turned slightly downward, and there was an insufficient line of demarcation between his cheeks and throat. Senior has come to see you, son, his father, dear little Iosalop, announced. I have been waiting for Senior a long time, bridegroom Iodu replied. Including myself, in spite of my somewhat dubious existence, there were now five men in Iodu Asterisk S spacious bedchamber. I shall disclose presently who the fifth man was. An embarrassed silence hung over the group. I looked around for a place to sit down and waited for the bridegroom or his father to invite me to be seated. No matter whether I was clothed in my portly, material body or in my unsubstantial, ghostly body, I felt very tired. My limbs in the shabby dress suit felt battered and bruised. But no one invited me to have a chair and to exchange my painful, erect stance for a comfortably collapsed sitting position. B.H. had not informed me, among other things, that sitting, planting the full weight of the body on the comfortably supported buttocks, was an attitude that was assumed only in rare instances, as, for example, at table tilting. My newly acquired contemporaries regarded sitting about as we, by we, I mean the reader and myself after my return, regarded the squatting position of South Sea savages as an animal-like and almost obscene posture. Nowadays people sat down only for very definite purposes. The basic positions of the present age were standing and lying. Only the unbroken line, whether vertical or horizontal, was considered dignified. We, in our primitive time, were still too close to the sacred act of erection that changed man into a perpendicular biped, and we sometimes had to relax by exchanging the unbroken line for the broken sitting line. At this particular moment, I simply yearned for the comfort of the broken line. But it did me no good, for no one invited me to sit, and I could not just drop on the bridegroom's couch. As for the fifth man in our group, he was a mutarian. He was a frail little man who wore neither a silver nor a gold headdress, but frankly exposed his polished bald pate. Furthermore, unlike the other people in this house, he was neither naked nor draped in filmy materials but was enveloped in a coarse, brown garment that we could at once have designated as a cowl of the hood, and the knotted rope about the waist had not been lacking. I bowed deeply to this little man whom I took to be some sort of a clerical person, and it turned out that I was not entirely mistaken. The little man stared at me with large, strangely light eyes that did not reflect my image. He is a mutarian, B.H. explained loudly and began to go into details as though the person under discussion were not in the room with us. The Mutarians are more than a religious order or brotherhood such as you may have known back in your lifetime. They are bound not only by the three basic vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience, but in addition by the three biological vows of blindness, deafness, and muteness. That is, they are literally, and not only figuratively, blind, deaf, and dumb. In compensation, they have so developed their inner senses of sight and sound that nothing remains concealed from them, and they perceive all sights and sounds by means of their acute inner senses much more sharply and clearly than their mere physical senses would permit. I won't say too much about it, 
B.H. concluded his explanations, but unless I am mistaken, Brother Mutarian Lofra sees us all here without seeing us and hears our words without hearing them. In fact, he sees and hears so damn much that he sometimes scares me out of my wits. Am I right, Lofra? The blind and deaf-mute Lofra smiled all over his strangely smooth face in token of the fact that he had seen and heard everything, in fact much more than could be seen and heard with normal eyes and ears. The rosy smoothness of his features reminded me of the delicate new skin that forms over first and second degree burns. Lo Salop, the father of the bridegroom, the most affable and good-natured person I had met so far on my exploration, could not refrain from contributing his share in praise of the Mutarian. They can find anything, these Mutarian brothers, Senor, he said. You can hide a ball of yarn or a bottle of smelling salts anywhere you please and the Mutarian will walk straight up to it and pull it out of the most secret panel. Shall we try it? I wouldn't want to trouble the Reverend Brother, I said in alarm. I assume he has other duties in this house besides looking for balls of yarn and smelling salts. The Mutarians, said B.H. with the evident purpose of putting an end to this awkward conversation about a fifth person who was blind and deaf, and who, for that very reason, could see and hear more clearly than others. The Mutarians have made it their duty to offer their services and their abilities to brides and bridegrooms during the period of the wedding holidays. That explains everything. Certainly that explained everything. But it didn't explain why Lodu chose this particular moment to become impatient, in fact, angry. Nobody pays the slightest attention to me, he shouted at dear little Losalop, who was plainly startled. You bore Senior with all sorts of trite commonplaces, and you don't give him a chance to get interested in any of the important things here in my room. After all, I am the bridegroom. Senior might evaporate at any moment, and then I'd be left holding the bag. Why do you suppose I prepared all these historical questions for him? And besides, Senior hasn't noticed a thing yet. With a gesture of offended languor, Lodu raised his arm and pointed at the opposite wall of the room. The absence of windows in this era had never struck me so much as at this instant. In the definitely orange-colored light of the chamber, I soon learned that it was an imitation of the color of the planet Mars, or John the Baptist. The right-hand wall of the room turned out to be the display space of a museum. I looked in wonder but could not make out the significance of the rusty and dilapidated curios that hung there in great numbers. They were mostly thin tubes and pipettes, made of metals that were strange to me, some of them transparent as glass, others translucent as soapstone. Remnants of electric wire wrapped about the lower ends of these pea shooters indicated their origin in an era of electricity probably not far from my own. There are a few very valuable excavated objects among them, some from periods before the sun catastrophe, Losalop declared with paternal pride. As he spoke these words I discovered among all these uninteresting pipes that meant nothing to me, a primitive bow with a quiver for arrows in the wreckage of a strictly up-to-date submachine gun of the Second World War. Gentlemen, I exclaimed, why, those are weapons. Two of them I know very well, a bow and arrow, and a machine gun of the latest model, the latest model, of course, from a point of view that I held some thousand centuries ago. It is a practical automatic weapon without a tripod. Senior recognized the most important pieces in my collection at the first glance, the bow and the powder gun. Lodu commented with a show of respect. That's no trick. Monsieur, I replied modestly. For these are the only weapons here with which I have first-hand acquaintance. The rest of them, if they are weapons at all, are entirely unfamiliar to me. The other objects that you see here, Senior, the bridegroom expatiated eagerly, are found much more frequently when excavations for new houses are made. They, too, date back to primitive times, but to later eras than the bow and arrow or the powder gun. The scholars call them trans-shadow disintegrators. If you look more closely, you can easily distinguish the clumsy trans-shadow disintegrators of primitive wars from the more advanced, slender ones of the last war. Although I could not exactly distinguish the pea shooters from each other, I stepped closer, feigning a polite interest. The bridegroom indeed seemed to be a great balologist, a student of the science of war. His slightly bloated face glowed with the agitation of his monomania. Undoubtedly, the younger generation was no longer as dispassionate as their elders. The bride's father, 
Lofager, had been quite right in his complaint. The longest and thinnest of the trans-shadow disintegrators, Bridegroom Lodu continued with growing zeal, were directed against cities that were built high up over the surface of the earth. Did you ever know any cities like that? Senior, I never knew of any other kind, I answered truthfully. The skyscrapers in these cities were a thousand to two thousand stories high, Lodu went on enthusiastically. Is that right, Senior? In my time they only managed to get up about a hundred stories, I explained modestly. The Empire State Building was the highest one I knew. Still, the skyline of New York was fairly respectable, especially for people coming from Europe, which had cities like Paris and Vienna that were splendid but never went in for tall buildings. It is not unlikely, however, Monsieur, that later history may have seen buildings that extended up into the stratosphere. I don't know. Well, that proves it, the warm-ad bridegroom interrupted, drawing rash conclusions with youthful indiscreetness. That proves that mankind is indebted to the trans-shadow disintegrator alone for the boon of living no longer high up over the surface in the terror of the atmosphere, pitilessly exposed to the rays of the sun and stars. But in the homely lap of the lithosphere, the trans-shadow disintegrators, you know, cleaned up that skyline of yours in a hurry, in fact, in a matter of seconds. And to think that there are still people who deny the contribution of former wars to the progress of the race, as, for instance, the official guide of our era or even my own father. Poor modest Losalop looked dismayed. I don't venture to have an opinion of my own, son, he said. I'm no historian and antiquarian. What do I know of that bloody myth that people used to call war? All I think is that we, the people of today, are not numerous enough for these ancient trans-shadow disintegrators on your wall. Bridegroom Lodu turned his young face eagerly toward me. My ability to distinguish youth from age within this general framework of youthfulness had meanwhile increased. May I assume, senior, Lodu asked, that you took part in the Trojan War? Not in person, I regret to say. I rejoined, although we studied about this war in school until we were sick and tired of it. Unfortunately, the historians were never able to agree whether this war really took place or whether it was the product of a poet's imagination. But certainly you participated in other wars, the young man insisted, in which, as in the Trojan War, a part of the warriors coalesced with animals that were called horses. Oh, yes, cavalry still existed in my time, although it was becoming more and more motorized. And what was at stake in the Trojan War? the worthiest object imaginable, the most beautiful woman in the world. And in what war did you take part, senior? In the so-called First World War, from 1914 to 1918. Was that much later, senior? Yes and no. If you look at it from here, no. And for what reason was the First World War fought, senior? What was it about? As I formulated my answer, I was uncomfortably aware that I was not doing justice to the Second World War. But Lord, that was all so long ago, and I was too tired to draw fine distinctions for this strange audience merely for the sake of my conscience. Well, now that you ask this question, my dear Monsieur, it's not so easy to say why the two world wars that took place in my lifetime were really fought. It was all mixed up with a murky hogwash about unemployment and ersatz religions. You know, the more fraudulent a religion, the more fanatically its adherents strike out in all directions. My former contemporaries had firmly made up their minds that they didn't want to have any souls or any personalities. They wanted to be egoless atoms in a material macrocomplex. One group adhered to a macrocomplex called nation and made a fetish of the accident of birth in a specific country and among a specific people. A second group adhered to a macrocomplex called class and made a fetish of the fact that they had been born poor and lowly and wanted no longer to be poor and lowly. These two macrocomplexes were, however, easily interchangeable for their adherents, since practically everybody was poor and at the same time was a member of a nation. And so most people of both groups didn't have the slightest idea why they had to kill each other. They really did it out of fear. But they were less afraid of each other than of their own leaders, and these leaders, again, were so afraid of the people whom they led or misled that they forced them to kill each other. I don't like your definition of war at all. Senior, said the bridegroom stubbornly and, parading his learning, he added, 
We have learned that wars between armed opponents were valiantly fought only when all human legal remedies had failed on account of the absence of a universal court of law. The wars of antiquity were, therefore, divine judgments, as our scholars have proved beyond a shadow of doubt. Bellum internecinum, that is, a war of extermination, was regarded as unfair and was forbidden, likewise bellum punitivum, or punitive war. It was also not permitted to employ precursories, assassins, or venevisi, poisoners, against your opponent, and perduelio, that is, subornation of treason, was generally abominated. After this little lecture, Lodu looked at me triumphantly from under his gold helmet. I had no way of knowing how far this Baroque, chivalrous concept of warfare differed from his real views. I applauded silently in order to indicate the extent of my admiration. After this little lecture, Lodu looked at me triumphantly from under his gold helmet. I had no way of knowing how far this Baroque, chivalrous concept of warfare differed from his real views. I applauded silently in order to indicate the extent of my admiration. Your knowledge of the chivalrous rules of warfare is astonishing, monsieur, I said. You make me quite ashamed of myself, for I never knew all these expressions, or else I forgot them long ago. And yet, theory is one thing, practice another. Just take a look at the trans-shadow disintegrators on your own wall. They were used exclusively for Bella Internecina, that is, wars of extermination. The bridegroom was about to make a rancorous remark, but his father interrupted him. You should not contradict Senor, son, said Timid Losalop. He saw it with his own eyes. He was there. Your knowledge comes from the Cephrodrome, from lectures, and from collectors' catalogs. Certainly, Senor was there, Lodu pouted. And so I should like to request most respectfully that he, as an eyewitness and combatant, tell us something of the First World War. Isn't that what it was called? I was startled out of my wits, for I found myself again in the same situation as a while ago when the spokesman asked me for, a little cosery, a few well-chosen remarks about the differences between the old days and now. I looked for help to my friend B.H., who stood next to me in his simulated weather-beaten uniform of a lieutenant of the First World War. He grew pale and shrank back. But I did not hesitate to say, haven't we a man among us who rose to officer's rank in the First World War? He is much better fitted to furnish the information that Monsieur Lodu desires in the pursuit of his curious hobby of ancient military history than I, who was a very mediocre soldier and just barely managed to get my sergeant stripes. Stop. F.W. Forward slash, B.H. exclaimed and imploringly held his hand over my mouth. I never imagined that you would treat me so unkindly, so unfairly. All right, it's true. I am reincarnated but I am much more than that. I am a contemporary of these gentlemen, a contemporary in every respect. I decline, I refuse, I protest violently against permitting my contemporary self to be brought into any relation with the apish affairs and stinking barbarisms of antiquity. And you should be the last to do that, F.W. But my dear old friend, I interrupted meekly and contritely, why do you walk around here in this field gray outfit instead of dressing like your esteemed contemporaries? B.H. nervously pulled the faded military cap down over his forehead. I am wearing this disagreeable disguise solely on your account, he said softly, so that you might feel more at home and not fall ill from a feeling of strangeness. So that's it, I thought. He's a good fellow after all. He didn't want to frighten me at our first meeting. But perhaps I wouldn't even have recognized him if he had appeared before me in the blurred nakedness or in the affected drapery of his contemporaries. At any rate, he recognized me at once, even when I was still invisible. That proved that he was a better friend than I. I suddenly realized that I had indeed acted unfairly by putting the burden of our common antiquity upon him. All the thoughts and aspirations of the reincarnated B.H. must have been directed toward becoming a full-fledged member of the present epoch and of its human society. To be sure, no reincarnated person could ever completely belong to any particular time. Suddenly, I gained a still deeper insight into the problem. B.H. was typical of the highest spiritual individual. But what is the spiritual individual if not one who has gone through several reincarnations? The spiritual individual can therefore never be completely at home in any age, and if he wants to adjust himself at least to some extent, he is forced to simulate membership in the society of his time. 
I tried quickly to make amends for my mistake and to attract the general attention away from BH. So I closed my eyes and sighed in acquiescence. How can I, in just a few words, give you any impression of what we experienced in World War I or II? Shall I describe the feelings of a relatively free young man who is unceremoniously jammed into a barracks with hundreds of others in order to be drilled, that is, to be subjected to a process of hardening and brutalization that fits him to be a soldier? How could I make highly developed people like you, who take no solid food and do not even expose your bodies to fresh air carrot, how could I make you understand the condition of men living by day and night for months on end in trenches, dugouts, and foxholes filled with water and muck, their lives endangered day in and day out by dive bombers, mortars, heavy artillery, field artillery, tank artillery, ships' batteries, machine guns of every kind, and God knows what else, until they pray for a severe wound just to be delivered from this horrible exposure? And worse than that, how could you gentlemen, who were so refined that a slight physical contact, as for instance a good old-fashioned handshake, plunges you into disgusted confusion, how could you ever get an adequate concept of what it means when a boy, maddened by rum, benzedrine, and party fanaticism, crawls out of his foxhole, gun in hand, and stumbles over muddy clods, shell holes, landmines, and barbed wire, over black, bloated corpses stinking to high heaven, on toward the enemy, filled with a breathless, insane lust to twist his bayonet in that enemy's guts even when he has thrown up both arms and is screaming for mercy. At this point, in my attempt to avoid the relating of specific war anecdotes by uttering the above generalities, I was interrupted by Lodu's clear voice. He lay stretched out straight on his couch, tightly wrapped in his black veil, and his face under the golden helmet shone with a dreamily attentive ecstasy that I could not understand. And how does it feel? Senior Slash, he asked slowly, when your own cold steel enters the enemy's body and a crimson fountain of blood gushes at you. I was shocked at the question and at the sensuously poetic tone in which it was uttered. But before I could gather my wits I heard someone groan softly. It appeared that delicate little Lo Salop had already become nauseated in the course of my recital, and now his son's question had finished him. He was ghastly pale, reached for his heart, and gagged a little. At once Lofra, the mutarian, who had seen and heard everything without seeing or hearing anything, stepped toward the father of the bridegroom and blew his breath on him, whereupon the latter quickly recovered from his blood nausea. Our parents are very nervous, senior, Lodu chided the older generation. But Losalop apologized to me in deep confusion. It will not happen again, senior. Suddenly Lodu jumped to his feet and exclaimed, and now we will show Sanyar the monument of the last war of the planet. To my disgrace as explorer and travelogue writer, I must confess that at this moment I was overcome by well-earned exhaustion. In spite of my dress suit and medal, I was on the point of dropping where I stood. The news that I was to be taken sightseeing at this moment, no matter though it were something as important as the monument of the last war, simply filled me with terror. But I remained silent and made no mention of my fatigue by no means from curiosity or from an explorer's impulse, but from pure cowardice and perhaps even from a sort of vanity. Could the materialization of a human who had lived around hundred millennia ago fold up so disgracefully and ask for consideration of his body which, in spite of its completeness, was, after all, only an apparition? An apparition either had to dissolve or stand firm. There was no third course. Since I had not learned how to dissolve, I resolved to stand fast and to give no indication of physical weakness. But for the next few minutes, all words and movements fell on my ear as though from a great distance and as though I were lying on the bottom of a stream. Bridegroom Lodu appeared to be very excited at the prospect of taking his antediluvian guest to see the monument of the last war. In a brusque voice, he ordered the deaf, dumb, and blind little fellow in the cowl who served him in these days, Lofra. My spare mentalable has somehow been mislaid. Find it, please, and make it snappy. The mutarian, from whose inner sight and hearing nothing remained concealed, slipped silently from the room. Mentalable, that sounded like some kind of toothpaste back in the 20th century. But I was at once informed that it referred to the mental traveling instrument that I had already seen. 
A moment later, Lodu handed me the mentalo bowl which the Mutarian S in her sight had quickly discovered in its insidious hiding place. I was quite embarrassed. Would I succeed in getting the little globules into the right holes in the puzzle? Now a minor quarrel arose between the bridegroom and his father. How often do I have to tell you, son? Papa Losalab timidly ventured to criticize that you should not travel in a room or in any enclosed place. I'll travel anywhere I please, Papa. T am a grown man, and day after tomorrow I'm to be married. God willing, yes, son. But traveling in a room damages the house. And day after tomorrow it will be your house. So you are damaging your own house that the community provides for you, and that you are to occupy for the next 150 years. The allusion to his own property seemed to change the son's mind. Very well, then. Let's ride up, he said brusquely. The room gently floated upward. Every room of the house could be separately elevated. How it was done, I don't know. Trained engineers will have to explain it. But just before we stepped out of the room to the upper platform of the house that resembled the observation tower of a warship, I noticed another object in the collection of weapons with which I was familiar, but which had so far escaped me. It was a good, solid, single-action Colt revolver, a regular old-fashioned persuader from the last century, by which, of course, I mean the 19th. I looked around desperately for B.H. and, having found him, whispered to him to tell me quickly upon what to concentrate my thoughts as I awkwardly and nervously tried to maneuver the last light green globule into the last little hole, marked. Keenly directed desire slash, he winked at me and whispered back, just think of an enormous, concave platter. It really was an enormous, concave platter that extended under our feet in the next instant. But this expression is incorrect, since the change of place and traveling occurred without the slightest lapse of time. I should therefore say, in the same instant. Asterisk it was the largest place I had ever seen, obviously a public square, extending to the distant, perfectly circular horizon, which had been raised in such fashion as to form the rim of a conclave platter. This rim was adorned with shadowy, theatrical architectural suggestions, as for example towers and turrets, gable ends, spires, battlements, and gothic tracery. All of it was rather low, toyish, and artificial, as though to simulate silhouettes at infinite distances. The orb of the sun was declining in the west. The firmament was light green, the exact color of the mental globules in the travel puzzle. Deep lapis lazuli shadows moved across it in rhythmic undulations. The sunset served to accentuate the two-dimensional character of the toy architecture on the horizon, which was only intended to differentiate by mean carrot of divers' ornaments above ground the official edifices located far below. Where are we? I asked B.H., and it seemed to me that not my skin, but my heart was covered with goose pimples. We are in the geodrome, said B.H., or, if you prefer, in the central plaza. Why, of course, geodrome, I replied, as though I had known this designation all my life. I was no longer willing at this stage to act the part of an utter greenhorn. I looked down at my brittle patent leather shoes, whose appearance had not improved since the last time they had been squeezed onto my feet. The new pair that I had recently bought, and that had to be among my effects somewhere, had sensibly and maliciously been kept with the heirlooms instead of being given to me. But before I could manage to become sufficiently annoyed at the stinginess of my esteemed heirs, I perceived to my great astonishment that I was wearing a pair of very narrow ice skates on the soles of my cracked shoes. I could not remember when and where they had been strapped on. But without skates, which all the rest of the party seemed to be wearing, locomotion in the tremendous geodrome, the central plaza of California, or of the continent, or perhaps of the entire globe, how should I know? Care it would have been extremely difficult and wearisome, if not impossible. For the floor of this central plaza consisted of an icy substance, smooth as a mirror, that covered the entire surface of the circular, concave platter which, according to my estimate, was at least twenty miles in diameter. A foot tour across its expanse or along the shadowy architecture around its circumference would probably have consumed days and would have required physical endurance which the delicately built and easily fatigued humans of the present did not possess. Moreover, the use of the mentalable was impossible for perfectly plausible reasons. 
for the geodrome was an objective. Only objectives in their entirety could be moved toward the user by means of the mitilobal. The travel puzzle did not function within the confines of an objective, even an objective as large as the central plaza. In order to facilitate locomotion of the human body within the confines of a large objective without reviving prehistoric wheels and brakes, the metal-winged shoes of Mercury had been adopted, which not only afforded speedy progress but also the pleasurable sensation of physical movement. Through contact with the sharp runners of the skates, the glassy floor became elastic and promoted motion, even better than the iron-gray sod, especially on the downgrade toward the lowest point of the platter toward which we were moving now. My fatigue of a few minutes ago had totally vanished. With indescribable rapture, I enjoyed the windblown speed of our glide. The gold-helmeted bridegroom whizzed along at the head of our group, which had been joined by the ever-curious bachelors of the household, the spokesman, the house sage, and the permanent guest. I noted that their skates were strapped to fairly high buskins, which were apparently always worn outside the house. The bridegroom alone was draped in black. The others had wrapped their naked bodies in veils of various pastel shades. B.H. in his field gray uniform and I in my dress suit brought up the rear. And as I sped along I could not repress a childish shout of joy, a sound quite inappropriate for an apparition of my age who had been drawn fortuitously from the alphabet and summoned here. And yet the shout was justified for it was perfectly delightful to skim rapidly over the surface of this altered and improved earth after such a long absence. B.H., who was responsible for my presence, seemed to understand my feelings and smiled indulgently at my shout of joy. My weak eyes were probably to blame for the fact that I suddenly and unexpectedly found myself in the midst of a huge throng that moved about a great circle fenced off in the middle of the central plaza. My heart began to beat even faster than it had done a few hours ago while I was standing in a dark corridor waiting for the signal that was to summon me into a pleasantly lighted room to appear before my new friends. I had by now become accustomed to the bridal family. The ladies and gentlemen of the household did not fill me with greater fear and shyness than I had always experienced in the presence of strangers whom I had been required to visit. At this moment, I was petrified at the thought of losing sight of dear pompous Losalop, of the spokesman, the house sage, the permanent guest, even the bridegroom, not to mention B.H. The little company of those who belonged to the household where I felt relatively at home. For it must be confessed that I trembled in my dress suit at sight of this crowd, of these hundreds of strangers, among whom one moved with the feeling that my resurrected physique could scarcely muster the strength to bear the compact presence of people who were actually separated from me by millennia in time and light years in space. I beg the indulgent reader to consider this point well, lest he despise me for my shaking knees and chattering teeth in the presence of this throng of humans of an unspeakably distant future. My mental discomfort, I should like to call it, Historical discomfort carrot was so intense that I could not even distinguish the individuals about me. Again, I proved unworthy of my calling as a reporter of the future, for I can record my own jittering and chattering, but not the objective picture of the crowd, unless I want to take recourse to pure fancy. This throng was a rhythmic entity, a swirling, a dancing, a spinning, a pirouetting, and a moving tapestry, embroidered with twittering, euphonious voices of silver, dull gold, light blue, pale green. But imagine my discomfort when the crowd suddenly receded and I, shuffling on my skates, found myself standing with B.H. in a reverently cleared space. Of course, it was the spokesman who hadn't been able to keep his mouth shut for, after all, it was his job to keep it open. From him the bystanders had learned the character of the apparition that had dropped into their highly developed and civilized world. The news spread like wildfire, to use a figure of speech that really belongs back in the beginnings of mankind. As for me, I was bathed in perspiration, for everyone stared at me with eyes distended with curiosity. All I could think of was to hold on to B.H.'s arm in a frenzy of distress. They are friendly people. My reincarnated friend soothed me. They won't bother you. Pay no attention to them. Just smile all over the place, and be sure to show your teeth. He supported me with a friendly arm, and together we glided to the circular fence which had suddenly been cleared of people Bridegroom Lodu, Father Losalop, and the three bachelors joined us, 
the multitude followed at a respectful, curious distance. In keeping with B.H. slash S. advice, I turned and gave the shadowy human wall a forced, theatrical smile that left a bad taste in my mouth, remembering to bare my teeth briefly. I was unspeakably ashamed of this politician's grin, but it seemed to be effective, for a soft muttering of approval came back from the throng. I had long ago learned the lesson that the only way to get along in this new era was to be agreeable at all times and in all places. This toadying really didn't mean a thing. It was mere unfounded and undesigning amiability, good manners, friendly behavior. At the same time, it was an unconscious apology for many dark ages in which men had bared their teeth only to snarl at an enemy, and for many other, later. But equally dark ages in which photogenic people had bared their teeth in order to sell themselves to the public. I held onto the wrought iron railing with both hands and looked down into an enormous, circular excavation which gave the impression of an old, long-abandoned mine whose surface structure had remained intact while the lower shafts and galleries had collapsed or been drowned out. The impression of a mine was heightened by the fact that the side walls of the fairly shallow excavation were seamed with glistening mineral loads and studded with glittering crystal geodes. In spite of my weak eyes, I seemed to distinguish amethysts, topazes, and rock crystals. But today, after my return, I have the feeling that I saw not only semi-precious gems, but also fabulous rubies and sapphires gleaming in the twilight. But that would have meant nothing, for the people of this age neither venerated gold, which had lost its importance as an index of value, nor did they make the slightest distinction between a lustrous glass bauble and a genuine jewel. In this respect, they had reverted to the primitive and naive state of naked South Sea Islanders who prefer the cheapest glass trinket to real gems. This is the monument of the last war, said someone near me, and I craned my neck to see something in the broad excavation within or below the rail that might resemble an equestrian statue or a group of heroically muscle-bound figures a la Rodin. But I discovered nothing of the sort. Finally, my unfortunately naked eye settled upon a spherical, rusty framework, about six feet in diameter. At first, I could not make the slightest sense out of this sphere consisting of warped metal bands. Then it suddenly dawned on me that it must be an ancient celestial globe, manufactured long after my death, but still in darkest antiquity. As my eyes became more and more accustomed to the ruddy twilight in the excavation, which now seemed to me to resemble not so much a mine as the basin of a great pond from which the water had been drained. I perceived that the dilapidated and warped celestial globe surmounted a gigantic pedestal made of skulls, similar to but larger than the so-called cairns which are found in the valleys of the Styrian and Corinthian Alps. My understanding of the psychology of the present had by now become so keen that I clearly felt the mythical horror that the sight of this foundation of skulls must have provoked in the hearts of these contemporaries who had deleted the word death from their vocabulary. My dreamy contemplation was interrupted by the sharp voice of the bridegroom, which rang through the deep silence that prevailed in spite of the great throng behind my back. Where is the official guide? he shouted. He's not on the job, although he was called up in plenty of time to prepare for Senior's arrival. I wonder who called him up, I thought. It was only a few moments ago that Lodu had the notion to make this excursion. Perlo Solop tried to calm him in a whispering voice. You may be a bridegroom, son, and you may have the right to raise your voice as often and as loudly as you wish. But I still wouldn't parade my lack of self-control in front of the whole world. If the zero facial guy doesn't get here this instant, growled Lodu, I shall personally waken the global major domo. I have the right to do it. A man gets to be a bridegroom only once in a lifetime. There comes the official guide now. Lo Solop sighed with relief. He certainly had a hard time with his spoiled boy. As though he had actually crawled out of the bowels of the earth, a man suddenly appeared on the scaffold-like structure that rose from the floor of the mine or from the pond basin and projected a few feet above the surface of the surrounding geodrome. There isn't much to say about this man except that he looked like all the rest of them, carrot beardless, ageless, and without wrinkles, just like the mutarian at home. However, he wore no headdress on his smooth, round skull. For this reason, I have classified the official guide among the high state officers. Meanwhile, 
The thousands who filled the middle of the central plaza crowded a little closer to the railing, although only a small number of them could hope to see anything, for the monuments of this age, like the dwellings, were below the surface of the earth. The official guide cleared his throat for a long time, but he had no microphone in front of him to amplify his voice. The only relatively technical instrument that I had seen so far in this mental era was the travel puzzle, the mentalobol. Nevertheless, the voice of the official guide boomed out with such force and carrying power as if the airwaves were set into increased vibration by some unknown trick. Esteemed iOS of both sexes, he began his lecture with the chronic raucousness of all guides. You have assembled in the Geodrome today in large numbers to examine the oldest of all monuments that remote antiquity has left here on Earth, a monument whose meaning need not be discovered by scholars, a monument. Documented throughout the ages by history and literature that has occupied this very spot since the continuity of human memory began. As official guide of the era, it is my honor and privilege to welcome all those present, in particular, however, the dear little children who have been brought for the first time to see the monument of the last war for their education and edification. The man on the platform which projected above the surface of the earth in the manner of a scaffold over an excavation made a short, shrewd pause for effect. Then he continued in a somewhat softer tone and his oratorically fluent raucousness was more reminiscent of a politician than of a guide. Over and beyond that, esteemed Los, I have the rare honor today of acting as the official guide for foreigners, to use my full tide and in the true sense of the word. And not only as an interpreter of monuments for the inquisitive and curious and for evening strollers. For there is a genuine foreigner in our midst thanks to the kind offices of the Lofager and Losalop families, next of kin to a bride and groom, respectively, who were celebrating their three great days at this time. We are deeply indebted to these highly respected families, whose unremitting efforts, ably assisted by a family friend who wishes to remain anonymous, have made it possible for us to salute a guest from the beginnings of the human race a guest whose authenticity is proved by his white-skinned body and his stiff, coarse costume, as you can all see for yourselves. I salute Senor, with the wish that he may feel at home in our midst. I didn't feel at all at home. It was one of those moments when one looks around for the nearest mouse hole. The crowd applauded and whistled a little, about as a crowd might have done back in my day in greeting a third-rate celebrity of whom they knew practically nothing. Although it was obvious that I was not a success, I smiled my thanks in all directions and skinned my teeth. The official guide, who was suddenly holding a pointer twice as long as a fishing pole in his hand, pointed it at me. I take the liberty of calling attention to the fact slash, he said, that Senior is paradoxically by far the oldest and by far the youngest among us. As a worthy member of primitive humanity, he is of such incredible infancy a baby in the history of evolution, so to speak, care it that everyone, and particularly the ladies, might be tempted to lay either curious or maternal hands on him. As a welcome visitor in our present day, on the other hand, he has survived two world epics in complete physical vigor, two epics so remote from each other that we recoil in awe before his incredibly advanced age. Isn't it so? A murmur of approval ran through the crowd. These people were living in a mental era and therefore showed a more intelligent appreciation of clever paradoxes and antitheses than those of a period of journalistic reverence for facts. Despite my extreme old age and my extreme youthfulness, however, I felt exactly as I did just before I had fallen asleep, in other words, about fifty years old. I heaved a sigh of relief when the fishing pole in the hand of the official guide veered away from me and pointed at the dilapidated celestial globe. At that time, senior and esteemed friends, he finally began his official discourse, at that time when the metal workers pounded out the framework of this primitive replica of the celestial sphere from the metal then so widely used. Humanity had already survived the worst. For the last war was not waged like the next to the last war with hopeless fiendishness by all against all. No, it was waged by 10,000 selected men against another selected 10,000. The two armies of 10,000 annihilated each other, down to the last man, in the space of three and three-tenths minutes. 
This proved that the warlike settlement of disputes could no longer really settle anything and could therefore no longer be regarded as up-to-date. At the expiration of the three and three-tenths minutes of destruction, a few fanatical voices were raised, to be sure, who wished to incite the two parties against each other for the purpose of complete extermination. But strangely, creditably, and unexpectedly, the voice of reason prevailed for once. People recalled the horrors of the next to the last war which had devastated and depopulated the planet for many generations, which had made cave dwellers of the survivors, had robbed them of science and technology, and, according to some historians, had even deprived them of the power of speech. The low stage of intellectual development of mankind at the time of the next to the last war is amply attested by their clumsy weapons. We are all familiar with the trans-shadow disintegrators that are found in inexhaustible numbers. The children in the park of the worker play with these trans-shadow disintegrators which fortunately no longer expose the universe within the microcosm by smashing the nuclei of the unicles dash. I beg your pardon, interjected fiancé Lodu in defense of his own collection of weapons. The eyes of the official guide sought me out before he continued his interesting lecture. Naturally, I am reproducing it here in my own words and not in his. Thus it loses a great deal of its smooth coldness and its utter disinterestedness. To him, the official guide for foreigners of the era, war and the horrors of war were matters of greater indifference and unreality than the long-forgotten death rattle of shackled prisoners under the lead roofs of the dungeons of the Venetian doges to a cook's guide of our day. The era that immediately preceded the next to the last war, the speaker continued, no longer resembled the beginnings of mankind, an estimable eyewitness of which we have the pleasure of entertaining in our midst today. Senior could probably give us far more accurate information than the most learned scholar concerning the life of primitive man, at a time when every ten square miles sheltered a different tribe with a different language, different habits and customs. When they lived under tents or low, thatched roofs, or, worst of all, in anthills of box-like skyscrapers. I pressed B.H.'s hand desperately. For heaven's sake, I whispered, I won't say a word. I simply won't do it. B.H., evidently annoyed by my behavior, made a negative sign to the official guide, who nodded indulgently and continued his discourse without interruption. At the time of the next to the last war, our globe was already septilingual. There were only seven different languages, seven different peoples, seven different realms, just as there are seven colors. Some of these realms, peoples, and languages occupied islands. The others were confined to the continents. The inhabitants of the islands were wealthier, more peaceable, more intellectual, and less imaginative. The inhabitants of the continents were poorer in material things. They did not follow the dictates of universal logic, but lived according to vague emotions and dreams that filled their hearts. They were dissatisfied with their mode of life. These continentals, and for that reason they were given too much to fancies and dreams, and usually morbid dreams. But all their fancies and dreams were filled with unbridled envy of the islanders, who lived easier lives. The envious peoples, incited by prophets and other demagogues, united in a coalition which finally, as a result of insidious and dishonest policies, declared the next to the last war on earth. This war, as I have already indicated, led to the almost complete annihilation of both power coalitions, so that the wretched remnants of the human race had to start all over again and required several hundreds of years to create a new, timorous civilization. This new civilization, however, when it had reached its zenith, was more advanced than the preceding one, for it was ambiglossal. There were only two languages, two nations, two realms. This dual system seemed, for a time, to be successful, and the political theoreticians were beginning to gloat that it furnished the indestructible basis for eternal peace, especially in view of the fact that both sides adopted a law famous to the present day, entitled the Principle of Reciprocal Intervention. Delighted at this formula which could easily have averted the Second World War of my own era, I exclaimed, Here, here, that's a first-class law. Thereupon the bridegroom, the spokesman, the house sage, the permanent guest, and a few others turned toward me with amazement and without comprehension, while my reincarnated friend pretended that he hadn't heard anything. The official guide, however, 
paid no attention at all to my parliamentary expression of agreement. It was an illusion, he said with the baritone vibration of a clever actor who lets his well-rehearsed speech reach an emotional climax only to die away in a cadence of futility. The two-nation system did not bring salvation to mankind, and many, many more eons passed and many changes took place in the constellations before man finally succeeded in eliminating the terrors connected with the natural conclusion of his life, and before he attained that mild freedom and dignity which made war and the concept of physical hostility an absurd nightmare that modern man regards as a tissue of lies of eccentric historians rather than as a hellishly real torment to which his own. Race was subject millennia ago. Yes, if it were not for the trans-shadow disintegrators and for the other weapons upon which our houses are, in a sense, built dash. Here, here, exclaimed the bridegroom in a satisfied voice. And this monument of hammered metal, erected upon the 20,000 well-preserved human skulls of the last war. At the words, human skulls asterisk, many children began to cry and wail. Their mothers tried to quiet them by soft words or by singing lullabies. A sorrowful buzzing ran through the crowd. The great throng retreated shyly from the fenced space about the monument as though no one had the courage to bear the sight of human skulls. Again someone, and this time it had been the official guide of the era carrot, had avoided the word death. Asterisk, but what did he mean by the mild freedom and dignity that man had given to the natural conclusion of his life? Again and again I was confronted with the well-guarded secret of the present world, and this mystery made a deeper and deeper impression on me. But I quickly had to turn my attention back to the lecture, a few sentences of which I had already missed. And so, the hoarse eloquence struck my ear. It was not the natural friction of economic necessity, as in the primitive stages of history, that led to this war, nor a difference in the manner of divine worship. It was nothing but purely absurd vanity. All of us, and particularly the pupils of the elementary pedeterian, to whom I dedicate a special word of welcome. Carrot know from our study of history that the two nations existing on earth at the time of the last war of the planet called themselves the Blues and the Reds. Now the Blues as well as the Reds, in the course of their history, had accumulated a vast number of illustrious names of great men and women in all fields of human endeavor, as for example, divine science cosmic wisdom, chronosophy, star-roving, marveling, foreign feeling, poetry, science of matter, science of perception, music, plastography, pictography, physical agility, and play, although the latter, that is the value of aimless play, was not understood in its entirety until just before our own time. So there were blue and red geniuses in abundance. They were called immortal and their names were surrounded with great pomp and circumstance as a surrogate for the excitement of politics which, even at that time, had begun to pall. Then one day a blue or red astronomer made the suggestion to change the names of the stars, which had not been altered since time immemorial, to those of the greatest divine scientists, cosmic sages, chronosophers, star-overs, marvelers, foreign feelers, poets, scholars, pictographers, singers, dancers, ball players, billiard players, and so forth. The other nation replied without delay that they were delighted with the idea of studying the firmament with the names of blue and red geniuses. An illustrious world congress was convened and sat in sessions for several years. In the first few years there was perfect agreement among the delegates. At first, the great geniuses of antiquity that had been preserved in history were transferred to the stars, and there was a goodly number of them, then followed the names of red and blue leaders in all fields. Unfortunately, however, there were infinitely more celestial stars than human stars, and in the process of renaming the denizens of the night skies with names now long forgotten, the Congress was forced to resort to celebrities of third, fourth, and fifth grade. At that point an infernal demon blinked his eyes, and on account of some nonentity of a ball player or cabaret singer, Carrot the historians have never been able to establish which Carrot the Great Quarrel broke out. The Blues, or it may have been the Reds, Carrot left the convention hall in high dudgeon and amid loud protests. A pinprick had been sufficient to arouse the slumbering national hatred and to disrupt the highly touted two-nation system. 
At any rate, however, the stars in the sky were the cause of the last war. As the duel of the twice 10,000 is called, the stars in the sky. Definite progress. The stars, stars. The words of the official guide of the era died away in my ear. I could no longer understand them. It had become night, and I raised my eyes to the night sky. I thought of a lovely summer night when I had similarly raised my eyes and thrown back my head until it was almost horizontal. It was near our house in the foothills of the Alps. The Milky Way arched over my head at that time too, but the moonlight was so strong that the fluttering veil of stars seemed a mere breath. And now I was dead. And as if that were not enough, here I was in the strangest of all worlds, a curio on exhibition. And how the sky had changed. There was as little similarity between it and the meager sky of that long past night as there is between a meadow rank with flowers in July and a meadow in March after the last snow has melted. I am no astronomer nor any other kind of stargazer, but the number of stars seemed to have increased tenfold since my lifetime. Was it only the drier, clearer atmosphere of the Earth that revealed more millions of stars than ever before? Had new stars in countless numbers sprung into being? Or was it merely that the good old moon was gone? Suddenly I felt a well-nigh dreadful sorrow rising in my throat, an ineffable grief, such as I had never felt before. I felt hot tears running down my cold cheeks, for it had become chilly by this time. I was much too sad to reach for my bedraggled handkerchief. I clenched my teeth and leaned my face against B.H.'s shoulder. What's the matter with you, F.W.? He asked in a worried tone. I'm so sorry about the moon, B.H., I stammered.